<laughs> okay. Good evening with this meeting of the Oyster River School Board. Please come to order and would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. We're here to meet the two new candidates. Good. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, um, this evening, uh, I, uh, for the benefit of the school board and the general public, uh, wanted to introduce uh, the two candidates that I'll be nominating for the positions uh, of. Uh, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, and the other one is for the position of uh, Director of Special Services. The process involved uh, having uh, nine member screening committees uh, interview a number of candidates, <coughs> and when uh, finalists were identified, uh, finalists were, uh, were uh, uh, given a tour of all our facilities, our buildings, and had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, with various uh, factions of our um, staff uh, at each of the schools. And following that, uh, in consultation with uh, Dr. Morris, uh, uh, I came up with a nomination I'll be presenting to you, the nominations we present to you this evening. The first person I'd like to introduce is Carolyn Eastman, and I'd like her to come forward, please. There's a seat here. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I will just say a few things about Carolyn and uh, then uh, uh, have the school board opportunity to introduce themselves and then the process is I have three general questions that I will ask uh, Carolyn and uh, request that she respond in three to four minutes just as a way for uh, people to get to know you a little bit uh, and then following uh, the two candidates uh, I'll be placing names and nominations before uh, the board. So uh, Carolyn is a presently a resident of Madbury. Uh, she has children in our school system, uh, has been a special education teacher, a grade six teacher. She's presently a doctoral student at UNH, and she also serves as a national and state, state consultant uh, on curriculum and assessment issues. Uh, she has done extensive work with curriculum, instruction, and assessment. And I guess from this point, I would just ask the board members to introduce themselves, starting with Ian. Hi, Carolyn. Nice to see you. Hi, Carolyn. Uh, uh, actually, I've been buying, you know, full disclosure, fish from Carolyn for a number of <laughs> years. Uh, and I won't even hold it against her when I bought all the shrimp and I found out how hard it is to pound, uh, peel 10 pounds of shrimp. Uh, and I've also seen, uh, I think, uh, one of your kids did ski club this last year, so we definitely loaded skis in the pods, and just a great resource. Tom Newkirk, great to see you again, Carolyn. Hi, I'm Maria Barth. Nice to have you here. Hi, Carolyn, I'm Megan. I know we know each other. Our daughters were in class together last year, so welcome. Hi, uh, I'm John Parsons. I haven't worked with you before, it's really unfortunate. I feel alone in that. <laughs> you need more fit. But uh, yeah, I'm a student at the school board. Okay. I look forward to working with you. So uh, the first question, uh, Carolyn, is uh, uh, tell us about your career, your accomplishments, and your interests. Okay. Um, my career started um, the very first, I think, job, I'll say, was being a social worker in a group home for girls in Haverhill. Um, I, it was a 17-girl facility where girls were core ordered out of Boston, and that was my my first experience um, beyond uh, graduating from UConn. Um, and so I was there for three years, and it was there that I thought um, I gained incredible uh, real-world knowledge, and then um, decided that I was going to go into education. And uh, oddly enough, I left social work, and I. Um, I found that the, the work that I was doing in social work, um, or had done, was um, very instrumental in the middle school work I was doing um, at Rye Junior High School. Um, so I went left social work, started uh, working as an after school camp counselor for uh, a 
latchkey program through the YMCA. I was the program director for their after school program. Um, and then started teaching preschool in, in the town of Rye. Um, from there, I kept wanting to move up in grade. And um, I became a special education assistant uh, at Rye Junior High School. Um, and there, um, I had an incredible opportunity to work with uh, a leader that to this day, I consider a mentor. His name is uh, Dr. George Cushing, who really challenged me as an individual and as a, a new teacher, and uh, really had an expectation of us all that we would be leaders. Uh, we would, in our own capacity, in our own role in our school, um, and really pushed us to move forward. And with that, um, once I graduated with my master's degree from Lesley University um, in education, elementary education, um, I was then um, hired at Rye Junior High School as a sixth grade teacher. Um, I loved teaching. I was there um, at Rye Junior High, I believe, for about six or seven years. Um, and then um, I worked, did my student teaching at Greenland Central School in fourth grade. Um, in John Batty's class, which I love. Um, and then con I continued to teach at Rye Junior High where we did environmental school. I ran the after school newspaper. Uh, I taught trumpet lessons. Um, <laughs> we did talent shows, and I loved every everything about it. Um, it wasn't until I left on maternity leave that I started actually kind of fell into um, in trying to keep busy in education um, I was hired by the UNH Impact Center to do math um, professional development outreach, outreach throughout the state. And at that time, we were just getting into the standards-based movement. Standards-based curriculum materials were flooding the market, and we were helping schools around the state figure out how to help select those materials um, and better understand standards um, before selecting the materials. Um, through that work, I be I was uh, had an opportunity to go to Wisconsin Center for Education Research out in Madison um, and also um, attend several um, Chief Council of State School Officers the CCSSO meetings in Washington DC um, where later they invited me to become a consultant. Um, I have been a consultant for them for over 10 years um, and working exclusively on curriculum instruction and assessment um, but from a national perspective where I've had opportunities to impact policy. Uh, I work with several different state departments of education. I've worked with teachers for eight years in Ohio. My role in Ohio is I land, get in a car, and drive to schools all over the state um, and work with teachers um, and principals, which has been incredible. Um, and then, um, so in my consulting, I've been doing this for over 11 years. Um, and I've traveled a lot. Um, and so the idea of uh, coming home this past January, I was really um, focusing on how can I be home? How can I do the same kind of work and have an opportunity to not have to get on a plane? Um, so I've been doing some, some work with Ceresk um, out in Bedford, um, doing professional development with Dr. Ayers. Um, and I've been also working as a consultant for the New Hampshire Department of Education, providing Common Core State Standards workshops um, for teachers. Um, so being able to kind of bring um, kind of this national perspective, a state perspective, and a local perspective as well um, to the community is, is pretty, pretty incredible for me. So it's kind of nice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, is what attracts you particularly to Oyster River? And what particular strengths do you bring to the school system? What attracts me to Oyster River is um, I just think the quality of the educators. I um, have had firsthand experience with my children and meeting many of the educators. And I think it's their creativity, um, their determination to provide a high quality education. I love the community. Um, I've been a part of the community as a parent. Um, as a fishmonger, <laughs> as a, um, um, and as a, also as a professional developer. Um, and I think it's, it's really been um, neat for me to see, have multiple perspectives um, in the community. And I think because of my multiple roles that I've had in the community, I think that's a strength. I see the, the perspective of a, a person in the community. 
I also have the perspective of that parent who is concerned, that taxpayer being the community member, but also as a, as a small business, a local, um, I <coughs> am a firm believer in local. Um, local as far as your community, local in supporting local businesses, how to connect people. Um, in my fish business, I started a program called Fish to Schools. Um, so fishing wasn't very far from education. Everything kind of gets back to educating people about <laughs> different, different aspects <laughs> of my life, and, some, and fishing is part of that. Um, and so I think one of the things I, I hope to bring, too, is one of, the, one of my lessons learned from being in the fishing business and coming new to that is that I needed to earn respect. Um, respect doesn't automatically come, uh, and it's not just um, something that's given freely. I had to earn the respect in the fishing community. They've been fishing far longer than I've been in education <laughs> and far longer than I've been in fishing. And it's through hard work and being able to see their perspective and through their eyes um, that I think over time I was able to earn some of their respect. And I, I hope that that's also true of Oyster River. So, Thank you. And the last question, uh, Carolyn, is uh, as a central office staff, the assistant superintendent, um, it's a very visible position. Uh, what would, could you do to ensure that there is good communication uh, that occurs uh, from your position to the public, the staff, the school board, and students? Um, one of the things that I know from being with my students here in the district is that in the schools that they're in, I become very knowledgeable about what's going on. Um, but even without having students in the high school, um, I, I still find information and I've been going to more events. And um, even with having students in the district, I wasn't aware of all the incredible things that were going on at the high school. The art show was just recently amazing. Um, the science research projects that were presented. Um, I walked around and had, had the opportunity to have students explain their research um, and how it, lo how it impacts um, local, our local community, talking about Great Bay and the quality of the water, um, informing our sports teams about the position of their lacrosse throw. Um, so I think one of the things about being in the community is this idea of, or the challenge, I guess, in the next year is how to create that transparency to people who don't have children in the community. How do they get to see, how do they get to celebrate all the great things that are happening in the school district um, that I, living in the community and having children here, might have not attended because my, my student, my children aren't there. Um, so I think, um, having an opportunity or a challenge to create that level of, of transparency, but also using media to capture, um, I use a lot of WebEx, I use a lot of Skype, um, just because of the nature of my consulting. If I could master technology, it meant that I didn't have to travel. <laughs> so there was this real desire for me to explore different ways of, of using the media and technology to better communicate. Um, to be able to use the videography uh, um, that happens at the high school and taking part, using them to help capture some of the events and maybe we can record those and, and post them. The idea of Channel 22, um, are there opportunities to, um, and this is something I'll have to explore, I'm, I don't know, um, but putting the Chicago, the play. Um, so even as a parent, there are things that I can't attend um, because there are other commitments and work that I think it would be wonderful for parents and the community to see at their own leisure or have multiple opportunities to kind of see what's going on um, here in the school district. And I think that's important um, because it honors the fact that we may have all best intentions of being at all these wonderful events, but maybe our schedules are just really busy. We know we're kind of pulled in different directions, but to still have those opportunities to get a glimpse of what's going on I think is really important. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, now I'll call upon uh, Catherine. <coughs> Good evening. Um, do you know everyone here, probably, or not? Uh, Maybe not. not I'll start with Anne. Would you introduce us? Hi, Anne. Hello. 
Hello, Ann Lane. Nice to meet you. Catherine, I'm sorry. How do you spell your first name? C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. You're welcome. And welcome. Thank you. I've heard tremendous things about the work you do. Thank you. Great. Al Holland. Tom Newkirk. Maria Bart. Ed Charlay. Megan Turnbull. Hi. John Parsons. Hi, John. Catherine Floyd. <laughs> uh, Kathy has been with us for past three years as the uh, holding the position of the preschool elementary special education coordinator uh, for PEP, Massway, and Harriman. Uh, she holds a certificate of advanced uh, graduate study from UNH, uh, has been a special education teacher, and has firsthand knowledge of our district, our community parents, students, and staff. So uh, welcome, Kathy. And since you're in the audience, you know the three questions. Are going to ask. <laughs> so the first one is tell us about your career, your accomplishments, and your interests. Sure. Um, my career started, um, I started my college career at the University of Maine in Orono. And I was from the county in Maine, and my family decided to move after I graduated. So we headed down to South Carolina, where I went to college, finished out my uh, bachelor's degree at College of Charleston in South Carolina. It was there I really um, started to learn who I was and where I was headed uh, in my career. I had a lot of great guidance down there, and it was a smaller school, so they were able to sort of individualize uh, for me. I got my bachelor's in special education and it got a lot of good uh, advice from an advisor to when I headed toward the master's route to look at elementary education and really um, you know widen my experience so while I started to teach I did my master's of education and also worked for a number of professors um, typing textbooks and really getting to know a lot about education as a, as a whole. Um, I worked in a high school down there my first couple of years I had um, students 9th through 12th grade, all different types of learners and, and uh, abilities. So I got uh, first-hand exposure to uh, lots of different types of students with um, little to no support. So it really was, congratulations, I'm down the hall if you need me, which was good for me as a young teacher. I had to learn a lot on my own and figure out where my resources were, and that's um, it worked for me. When I received my master's, I came back up north to New Hampshire and started working at UNH and investigated the CAGS program and I entered the CAGS program um, and that's how I got my administration supervision degree through UNH. Uh, that uh, road led me to a great internship in the Newmarket School District with Kathleen Murphy who was a superintendent at that time and she took me right under her wing and taught me a lot about being a great leader, um, being part of a community, uh, you know, being part of making sure kids came first. Um, so after a year of an internship in the superintendency, I was hired there as a special education coordinator. So I worked there for five years, um, actually with, with Sue Caswell uh, as well. And after uh, leaving Newmarket, I came to Oyster River, so I've been here for three years. Uh, working in Newmarket, I worked with a special education director who really exposed me to a lot throughout the state. She had lots of connections to different um, people in the state, and I started <coughs> learning a lot about um, what New Hampshire um, was about in terms of education. I started leading some initiatives with response to intervention. I started doing some statewide presentations. I worked with the New Hampshire um, RTI task force and I started doing some presentations for special education directors at their academies each year. Uh, so I started building a great network of professionals which is very useful um, in this field because you can pick up that phone and call someone when you need some support. Um, so when coming to Oyster River a lot of my interest was seeing how invested this community is in children. Um, I still do not live in the district. We've been trying to sell our home for a year to, to get over here. Um, and we'll be renting if we don't sell it. But we, I've seen how impressive the community is and how much uh, parent and family involvement matters and how much that really, uh, you know, gives the best for kids. When it's a whole approach between the school and the community, what amazing things we can do for our students. 
Um, so that's why I, you know, ended up coming here and was interested in Oyster River. And I'm a mom. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. So I'm very interested in, in getting them here so that they can also benefit from what Oyster River has to offer. Okay. Uh, so why, uh, second question, why this position at this time and what particular strengths do you bring? Sure. Um, you know, the special education director positions throughout the state are all a little bit different, I think. And what attracts me about this specific position is, um, you know, I've gotten to know the teams in the schools. I'm very invested in the teams. I've gotten to uh, make great relationships with families. And what I've come to learn about um, Oyster River is parents want the best for the students and so do the teachers. So it's really about us coming together and uh, figure out a way that we're gonna, you know, do the best we can for their student. I, you know, my strengths are with collaboration, working with families, working with teachers. I have experience um, with response to intervention, lots of curriculum experience, working with specific interventions that work for children. Uh, I'm a data-driven decision maker, so I really work with my teams around collecting data, using data, um, what's best for students based on that. You know, what do teachers need to be able to move forward, getting them the resources, and those kinds of things. Okay. <coughs> Again, uh, as a director of special services and a, uh, a staff member in a central office, uh, you become rather visible, both at board meetings and uh, various meetings. Uh, what would you do, or what do you think you could do to uh, enhance communication uh, among the constituents base uh, of our staff, parents, uh, and just the general community uh, relative to the responsibilities that you have? Mm -hmm. I think part of being a good communicator is uh, being a good listener. And uh, it takes that five extra minutes you have when somebody wants some information to really hear the other perspective. Um, when I'm thinking about making choice or decisions, I really bring the stakeholders together and what are we trying to accomplish here, what's our goal, how are we going to get there, and then let's communicate it to, to all the individuals to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, you know, when I think about the investment that we all have for students, making sure that we all have the same goals and that we build consensus together is really important. Um, you know, I'm knowledgeable about resources and, you know, how to really make things happen for students. So bringing in the people who know their expertise and sharing together uh, and communicating as a group is really important. You know, when we're all headed down the same path towards the same goal, we're going to get there a lot faster. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you have met the uh, two candidates uh, and I'm prepared to make my nominations. Uh, I would like to place before uh, the school board uh, the nomination for Carolyn Eastman for the position of Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Tom? I move the board accepts the nomination of Carolyn Eastman for the position of Assistant Superintendent. Second. <laughs> I'll move by Tom. Second by um, uh, discussion. Hearing none, could I have a show of hands, please? All in favor? Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And the second nomination is uh, for Catherine Plord as Director of Special Services. I make a motion to approve the nomination of Catherine Floyd as the Director of Special Services. Moved by Krista, second by Ann Wayne. Discussion? Hearing none, could we have a show of hands, please? Uh, all in favor? Congratulations. We will now take a five minute recess, so we're back on our seven o'clock <coughs> schedule.
Before we go on to public comments, there's something I'd like to say. When I ran for this position, I said I would always apologize if I made a mistake. And I made a mistake last time by allowing some comments based on emotions rather than issues. And that's my responsibility. We all get carried away with our emotions sometimes. And it's the responsibility of the chair to not let that go on. And my mistake led to the emails starting to fly and the social media humming. It also led to the superintendent taking his eyes off the ball which is to prepare for a smooth transition uh, to our new superintendent. And we all need to focus on getting a budget that we can all live with and a uh, strategic plan. So I'm sorry for my mistake. Uh, with the help of everybody, I'm sure we can do better. So thank you. Uh, and we'll go on to public comments. <laughs> Nothing bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you all look a little nervous. Um, Lorna Jacobson from Madbury. And I would like to just take a minute to recognize and thank Wally Keniston, who works at the high school as the library assistant. For the past year, Wally has served as the advisor on the high school yearbook. And for those of you that don't know, in prior years, the yearbook was put together by an English class. I think it was called Advanced Publications. But last year, because of low enrollments, the class did not run. And instead, four students took on the challenge of putting together the yearbook as an internship. Be beginning last June, Wally worked with them to see the project through to completion. He met with them about once a week over the summer and chaperoned them on an overnight field trip to um, well, field trip conference to Life Touch, who's the publisher in Connecticut. And the production of the yearbook, yearbook was an enormous amount of work, more than I think anyone anticipated. And the parents of the core group of four students who I'm representing truly appreciate the time Wally put in working with our children. There were many, many pressure-filled deadlines and late nights, but he was a good role model in terms of commitment and follow through. And they can all be proud of the end product. I'm sure Wally received some stipend for his work, but whatever it was, I expect that it does not begin to cover the amount of time he spent. So I hope when kids bring their yearbooks home and parents have a chance to look at them, they see a bit of Wally's dedicated dedication reflected in the pages. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, Kenny Rotner from Durham. A um, couple of points, and I'll try to, I hope I can get them all in. Um, one, it, something that has um, been apparent to me, and it's not at all unique to our school district, but um, if you look at performances in our school, the women are really outperforming the men. And if you look at National Honor Society, you look at who was the top ten. And um, I used to go see a band play a lot, and they did a cover of a Harry Belafonte song called um, Men Smart, Women Smarter. And I really believe a lot of the philosophy of the band, and I think that's probably true <laughs> too, but not to the degree that we're seeing here. And, and I know that this is something, uh, I know Howard Coulter was aware of it, Meredith um, was engaged in it. I, I, I think it's something that really maybe a task force should really look at if it's not, to try to figure out why the guys in our schools are not as engaged as maybe they should be. So that's the first point. Uh, second thing is I, I've heard at board discussions at times, and, and often they're at budget discussions, um, people on the board have talked about representing their constituency. And I've thought about that, and it, it strikes me, um, and maybe I'm wrong with this, but I don't think anybody ever ran on a real platform Nobody ran as part of a group. 
um, where they were representing that group or ran representing a segment of the population. And I would like to think of the board that your constituency is every student that's in our schools and every family or, or person who lives in our school district, whether or not they have um, kids in school. I see partisanship really making things in Washington awful, um, making things in our own state house awful, and I don't think partisanship really has a place on our board. Uh, the last thing, um, there was an article in the New York Times on Monday about rating schools. Um, Michael Weinrip, who wrote about our <coughs> middle school, I suggest everyone reads it because it really talked about the metrics that go into those rankings, which to me really doesn't reflect whether a school is good or not. I had the, um, I, the pleasure and really the it was a, an incredible opportunity to be a part of a panel speaking to a, a philosophy class last Friday and then attending the science fair at our school on Monday. And the level that our students are being taught just it blows me away compared to my education. And that's not anything that would ever come out in a metric. So I think it's a really good thing to read. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Preliminary action items, superintendents. Yes, actions. Uh, you have um, a letter of resignation from uh, Brian uh, O'Connell. I make a motion to accept the resignation, ORS, ORHS math teacher, um, with thanks and appreciation. Moved by Krista, seconded by Anne. There's a discussion. John? I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. O.C. on behalf of everyone at Oyster River. I've not taken a class from him, but I've had the opportunity to work with him on Senate for the past two years. And he's been nothing but wonderful the whole time. I've heard nothing but good things about anyone that's had anything to do with him here. And I know it's a, leaving is a big personal or professional and personal step for him but I'm very sorry to see him go. Yeah. My son had the pleasure of being taught by Mr. O.C. in Mr. O.C.'s first year here at Oyster River, and um, as a brand new high school parent, I found him refreshing, and he um, connected with kids on a level um, that I think resonated with the children and with the parents, and he'll be missed. <coughs> I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody else? Could I have a show of hands, please? <coughs> Thank you. That's it? That's it. From the superintendent. Announcements. Di district announcements. Mr. Allen. Um, I, I taught Alan from the high school. Um, I had the opportunity Saturday night to uh, represent Oyster River High School at the Excellence in Education Awards up in Manchester. Um, uh, Jay's not here, but he was also there with me, as well as uh, Danielle Bolduc and Chris Gallo, and our former IT director, Sonia Gonzalez, is there as well. Um, Oyster River High School was um, uh, recognized, and we have a nice plaque to, to show, uh, as a finalist in the Excellence in Education Awards. We were recognized along with Bedford High School as uh, two finalists. The, the, the winner of the Excellence in Education Award was Messenic, but we, I, we were very proud to be in that select company and to hear what some of these great schools are doing. Uh, middle school was also recognized as a, a finalist. Uh, they were the only, only middle school finalist, uh, and I actually I, I, I forget who won the, the middle school category. Um, and Sonia Gonzalez was recognized as uh, with an award for innovation and technology. So, and it was and it was based upon her work done before she left the district. So, uh, so it was a real good night uh, for Oyster River School District to be recognized in multiple ways. And so we were very proud of that, and uh, a lot of fun to be a part of that. Um, and then just a quick plug: uh, this is a big week uh, at the high school with all kinds of graduation activities going on. Uh, tomorrow night is baccalaureate. Friday night is graduation, and please. Pray to the rain gods that it stops <laughs> raining so that we're not standing in a mud hole when we do graduation. So, thanks. Thank you. Anything else? We'll move on to board announcements. 
Anybody? This looks like a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Correspondence. Okay, that um, <coughs> letter on May 17th claiming that the video recording of board meetings are a public record and that there's nothing inappropriate in posting them on the internet. May 21st, the letter urging the board to keep budget discussions focused on high quality education. It shouldn't be simply reactive to pressures from district towns. Uh, May 31st, a letter claiming that some comments concerning ABC appointments met the threshold that should have necessitated a non-public session. Also claimed there was texting in the May 16th meeting that may be in violation of the right to know law. And on June 4th, a uh, letter cautioning the board about involvement with the Confucius Institute and expressing concern about the plan for teaching foreign languages in the elementary school. Thank you. Commendations. I'll commend somebody. <laughs> mm. I'm going to commend um, the teachers in all the districts or in all the schools because this time of year, um, as a parent, I don't think, let's see, my oldest is eight, and I don't think we've been home earlier than 8.30 any night this week or will be um, because there's so much going on, and I don't know how the teachers keep those kids' attention for five minutes knowing all the stuff that they have to do from seven o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night most of the time. I saw two, three, four teachers and a billion other people who weren't even related to the show that was going on last night at the elementary school, but the reading specialist was there to support the kids and the principal was there to support the kids and everybody and their brother was there to, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. and. Um, these little first graders were doing the Three Piggy Opera <laughs> with their little homemade backsplashes and um, it was fantastic. And um, there's so much for support for our kids and I um, commend the teacher for being able to continue out the rest of the year while these kids are so excited for summer to come <laughs> and um, they have so much to do and they work long days this time of year um, and I don't know how they keep the energy from point A to point B. <coughs> Thank you. I second that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Tom? I'd just like to commend everybody involved with the Power of One presentations. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very heartening to go and listen to the, to see the presentation, but to listen to the kids talk about what they were doing and their enthusiasm. I thought that was really invigorating. And I think, you know, uh, your point, Kenny, I think it proves that point, that those are the kinds of things that make this district special. Also, just briefly, uh, Joe Lane, Foster Swimmer of the Year, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, And masters, we swim after the, this team swims, and it's really hard. It's amazing to watch this guy swim. And I know it takes, it doesn't take a village, it certainly takes a family to, to develop a swimmer like that. So, congratulations <laughs> to you. Come over and give me. <laughs> 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 I have one more, too. <laughs> and I thought, I thought the, at the last meeting, I, I think we were all gratified with the progress on uh, the facilities, the report that we had, and that. Uh, that so much of that was supported by grants that we got. So Sue Caswell, I know you were involved in that, and everybody else was involved in getting those incentive grants to help pay for that uh, those uh, the recommissioning of the high school. I think that was really great news. So to you and to everybody else involved, that that was terrific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just wanna, I want to commend our seniors who are graduating this Friday. Congratulations and have a wonderful future. Best of luck. Anybody else? Uh, approval of minutes. Motion to approve the May 16th regular meeting minutes. Moved by Krista, seconded by Ann Lane. Could we have a show of hands, please? All in favor. The manifests have been signed. Mm -hmm. Curriculum and instruction report. Yes, uh, this evening uh, we have a just brief report on some of the summer work uh, that will be going on and uh, noting uh, also now said uh, I believe it's June 19th we have a morning <coughs> workshop with our administrators and uh, the uh, 
Kathy Plord and Carolyn Eastman also will be attending. So uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for these folks to tie in with the work that's going to be going on this summer. So uh, Phyllis and Dennis are going to explain a little bit what's in store. <coughs> we uh, have put together a, um, a summer workshop that will unite both Mastway and Moharamit in unpacking the Common Core so that we um, do it together using the same language, using the same protocol, so that we, um, in, in my view, this is my professional view, the end result of it, it, it protects the ability of teachers to remain in charge of the curriculum and not uh, some scripted program from Texas or somewhere else like that. Um, so um, Phyllis is going to explain a little bit about wh what the content is going to be. I went to both schools this morning. I met with Mastway staff at 8 o'clock and Moharmet staff at 8.25, outlined it, and I've had a tremendous response from both staffs. So Dennis has taken on this leadership um, responsibility since I am not going to be here. So uh, we had the concern about transition and how are we going to ensure that this work is going to continue s seamlessly. And so I've been working with Dennis and um, also yesterday met with Ellen Irvin, the math coach, so that we could cover both content areas, ELA and math. And so basically um, the, the structure of it is to, um, the purpose of it is to support the work that's going to be done next year in early release days and uh, workshop days. We have dedicated two of each, for four total days, to work on um, unpacking the standards. And what it means to unpack them is to figure out what, what is it that we want kids to know. So we have to know what it is we're responsible for teaching. And then also, um, how are chil children going to be able to show us that they really do understand that content and uh, the level of knowledge, the level of thinking that is involved with each standard. So it's a two-year process, and there's a reason why the state um, has, you know, put this out ahead of us as a, you know, really it was a three-year project. And so even that doesn't feel like enough time because it is complex. It real when you start digging deep, um, it's a complex process. So basically, there will be two teams. Um, you, do you want to talk sure. about the structure? And there'll be a math team and a language arts team and what will happen is we, we will meet Phyllis and I and all of the people who volunteered will divide the group into two though the, the, these groups will determine which what, what days they're going to work it's going to be a four-day exercise and what we hope to come out of it with it with is a, a model that we can lep, um, replicate um, two is and this, this is the most exciting thing for me. It's Mastway and Moharamit working together on something that is uh, vital to the kids in the school district. Um, and the, there's one other piece I should have brought. Well, the, all, all the educators yeah. that are going to be on these teams will serve as mentors next that's year. That's it, yeah. So. That, that, that's the major practical advantage. Instead of starting in September and stumbling through and having to learn, we'll have eight, 16 leaders to help <coughs> at grade level to march through this uh, process. And the other positive thing that I think that the staff feels is we're not asking them to do it in 10 minutes or two days or three weeks. It's two years. And it will, uh, I think it will reap benefits for the kids and make us really zero in on um, what it is that we're you, what 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 instruction we're using. Uh, in a few minutes I'll be talking about the immigration project and it's a good example of what um, the uh, Common Core could do if it's used by the educators as a tool as opposed to um, a constraint. Question. Um, Dennis, for our audience's benefit, you've spoken to math and you've spoken to English language. What about science and social studies and languages? What is, what is the, the state's plan for rolling up those? We're not there yet. The state isn't there yet. Is um, there some sort of time the, the, frame? There, is, there isn't a time frame, not I don't think. Yeah. The, in, in, in most cases in elementary schools in particular, the focus is on reading and math. And it, 
To some degree that makes sense, but I think one of the things the Common Core will do was help us, will be to help us integrate in a better way science and social studies. It, um, it, it, you'll be able to see that in the immigration project. I, I think how the Common Core though does impact all those other content areas is that especially from grades 6 through 12, the focus is on um, the literacy skills mm -hmm. and uh, the research skills that um, really uh, wed literacy with the content areas and life skills of how are you going to be prepared to go into college and be able to you know, go through masses of information and be able to make sense of it and synthesize it. And so that's what the Common Core does, even though it's not specific to science, not specific to social studies and other technical <coughs> subjects. It is teaching you the skills to be able to navigate through those dense type of texts and be able to do something with it and make it make sense. So it, it does tap um, in, a, in a very heavy way. I've been waiting for this to happen because I don't have to sell it anymore. I'm saying, I know you're a science teacher, but you also need to know the language and literacy skills that are necessary to be able to access your content area. And so that's what the Common Core does for us, I believe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other thing, uh, selfishly, that I, I, I'm going to enjoy, hopefully we'll get this principal search done and that the new principal for Mastway and I will be able to spend some significant time together working on a common task. And that can't help but pay dividends down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Yes. Uh, from a, a last meeting of some of the correspondence we received, uh, there's obviously uh, some clarity, obviously some clarity was needed as to what is the protocol for the school department to distribute uh, videos of school board meetings. And uh, so I met with Kathleen, and, and I have to say, uh, I mean publicly, that essentially it wasn't clear. Uh, and, and I think from the school department, the school district, we need to say that there probably were lots of informal conversations or inquiries, but we really hadn't, I think the practice hadn't caught up to what the technology provided. I guess it's probably the best way to say it. And so uh, meeting with Kathleen, uh, here's the protocol that uh, I'm presenting to you this evening to explain it, and I'll post it on the website with school board meetings so everyone will know uh, what's being done. So essentially, uh, your school board meetings are recorded as digital files. And you can see uh, the broadcasts uh, essentially three places. Obviously, it's DCAT channel 22. And uh, there is web streaming that occurs. And uh, there's a web address that we can post for that. And for those who like hearing, uh, there's also iTunes. It takes forever to download it. Uh, but you can also, as you jog, listen for three hours of school board <laughs> if you so, so are inclined. Um, in any event, uh, they're there. If uh, there is someone from the public who desires to have a clean copy or a so-called good copy, uh, one needs, only needs to fill out uh, a right to know request. Uh, that we often get in my office, well, not as often this time of year for some reason, but we, we, it was a time we, it was almost, well, it was daily, it wasn't almost, it was. Uh, but you fill out a right to know request and it will come to the central office and with that the community member will be asked to bring a thumb drive to the high school and essentially from the broadcasting room here, uh, a thumb drive copy can be made with digital very very quickly and it's a high quality copy okay the other side of we're moving away from these discs it takes us I don't know three hours to make a copy of a disc and uh, so uh, we uh, are saying if you want a copy we can get bring a thumb drive you have a good quality copy you keep it for life if you wish <laughs> and uh, there you are but we, we keep uh, versions here, but we can convert them to thumb drive whenever the request is. Okay, so that's probably the easiest way to explain it. And what we will do is post this on the website so people will know as well how they can access. And uh, we're trying to constantly improve our communication and, and I guess, I'm trying to bring our practice up to where uh, the technology is. And also, 
sometimes there are questions about why people go into the broadcasting room and so uh, essentially what we're saying is that authorized people uh, go into the broadcasting room but it's also where someone who needs a hear an assistant hearing device can go so if you see people going in it's probably because they're getting one of these hearing devices so just to be clear to people uh, why people are accessing the broadcasting room while there's a program uh, being taped, okay? So I hope that that clarifies the question. It'll be posted and people know how to access videos. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Business I believe there's a question. Oh. Um, this could be more of a topic for a future meeting, but why is it that we don't simply post the video or post a link to the videos on our website? The you can access the broadcast, but in talking Kathleen, I believe it's the bandwidth that's needed for the quality. We it, don't stream live. <coughs> we don't stream live. We, don't we have stream two, live. We have two yeah. meetings available on our website. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But the other part is that to the good quality, uh, to make it available, I mean, it's the broadband that it would take to do it. That's why you, you can right. make copies quickly on your thumb drive, but to keep that broadband, uh, uh, w to copy it from our website would be too much. Okay. Uh, I guess the and then for Sue's report here, the essentially two pieces should be reporting on uh, the bus, two buses that we purchased and why, and uh, also the update on our finances. Good evening. Uh, I'll start with an update on our fund balance. Uh, in your packet, I prepared a report just based on the balance as of May 31st, and then obligations that haven't been encumbered and some of the um, <coughs> additional revenues we expect, um, trust fund reimbursement, and leaving us with a balance of about $878,000. Um, that figure is conservative. We have right now about $400,000 worth of purchase orders outstanding, um, holding out for obligations that were made, um, a lot of them prior to Phyllis's arrival for special education, and until that plays out, we're, we're going to hold those, but um, we suspect that will add to that balance, and we'll be pretty close to the million dollars we predicted back in October. Um, just so you know, it wasn't that we planned to have a million dollars. A lot of that is the results of some changes we made after the budgeting process last year. Um, one of the biggest ones was the change in the middle school model with um, the replacing 15 paraprofessionals with three teachers, so that was a substantial amount that left us um, with funds in our budget. Um, in addition to some changes um, in personnel staffing um, that we chose not to rehire. So that's pretty much it for budget. I'll be back to you once we wrap things up, do our audit, and give you the actual figures. Questions? Um, would you just explain for our audience what the food service transfer, $65,000 represents? Sure, sure. Um, it should, we've had in the past... Um, Operated in the red in that program, unfortunately. Um, our free and reduced is about 5%, so we don't receive a lot of funding from um, federal dollars, and, you know, it, it is difficult to maintain a program without that. So Andrew has worked really hard to bring the program back up, um, but we're still struggling to, to get in the black, um, and that's my prediction. We're, we're hoping it, that it will be better than that. Last year it was around 78, so, um, so it we're, it's a little better. Um, we're really hopeful it would be even better than that, but until we finish out everything, um, that's kind of where we think we'll be. Thank so. you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, the other piece that Lee mentioned was um, the bus bid. I think, Maria, you had asked me about bids and how the process works. Mm -hmm. And the way your policy states now, it, it pretty much is done internally. We don't necessarily bring it to the board for um, an approval, but I thought it might be wise to bring to you the information once we've gone out and successfully bid something and come back with the results. Um, as you know, we have two buses in next year's budget, so in order to have them ready for September, we have to start the process as soon as the budget passes. So Lisa puts together the specs, bids it out, people submit their bids, and she pretty much goes through them and decides which are the best fit for the district. So um, as a result, I don't have it in front of me, but and maybe Lisa can speak to what, um, what she's decided to purchase. I know one of them um, is a spec bus. It's a bus they have on the lot, so it'll be available sooner. I think it takes how many months to prepare a bus? About 90 days. About 90 days. From, so. from order to completion to delivery at the dealership. Uh, right. 
Are they all I'm not, are they all like the same coming from the same place? The bus? I mean it's like you're buying more verse than I am on this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think um there are some in Mexico, there are some made in Canada. So there's their different buses are made in different areas of the country world. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Do we normally purchase the buses from the same company year after year? Um, no, it really is. Uh, when I put out the RFQ, I, I have specifics that I'm looking for. Um, this one here was uh, to replace a couple of 77 passenger buses. Um, the one before was special needs specific, so it really they, they need to meet the criteria that we put forth, and that's really the number one decision maker, and then we go from there. Okay, can I ask a follow up question? Um, the bus we didn't purchase buses last year, right? No buses. We purchased them. We didn't utilize the funds out of last year's budget because of the retirement issue, but we did purchase them with fund balance from the prior year. So we okay, did, so that's what I'm thinking. It was two years ago. Yes. And um, the buses for the last couple of years that we've purchased, um, are we purchasing from the same vendor that we purchased those buses from? The only reason I'm asking is... Um, no. Have, no. Okay, good. <laughs> My kids ride on one of those buses and it seems like it's never working. So I was just wondering why. <laughs> How does, um, if you could just share with us the, 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 the cycle, the purchasing cycle um, that we have been working from, and is, are we still in that same cycle, or have we increased the amount of buses, to de decreased the amount of buses, where are we? I think we're still on cycle? a two, two a year replacement. We are a little behind in replacement, um, uh, but we're doing a good job keeping what we've got to DOT compliant, so. Um, yeah, it, it's basically a 10-year uh, average replacement uh, due to parts being uh, not readily available after 10 years, and you know the mileage gets up there, and then big issues start rearing. So, Lisa, could you uh, review the make of the two buses and what uh, <coughs> seems to be a good warranty that we have on them? The the uh, two buses that we've just purchased are um, international buses. Um, and the warranty was one of the pushes that, that with both buses we were able to upgrade from a five-year warranty to a 10-year warranty wow. on that's it, great. so that's phenomenal. Do they have seat belts? Do they have what? Seat belts. No, they do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think New Hampshire is one of the only states, I can't think of what the other one, that does not require seat belts. On the school buses, is there another one? I believe so. I, <coughs> because I, I think that's still an issue that's un, yeah. unresolved yeah. nationally because of the research showing that it causes as much hurt, damage as a safety could be because kids can't get out and get caught in those. Right. And they're manufactured with. But they do them. require them. I know Maine requires them on our pre-K buses. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I was just going to say pretty much exactly that when I was, you know, a little in riding the bus. We were kind of brainwashed into seat belts being unnecessary on the bus. And the seat belt was kind of a punishment that you know, the rowdy kids get. <laughs> 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 the ones that can't remain seated? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we have to go that route for ones that don't remain Strange. seated. <laughs> but the little kit, the little, little ones are seat belted and in car seats. Yeah, right. the, the uh, preschool, yes. If, if they go on a big bus, we make sure that, yeah. that there is a seat belt installed with the proper child restraint. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Student Senate report. The Student Senate is done for the year. We just finished our yearly elections. There are a bunch of new senators and new class officers. We've seen a remarkable shift in some of the kids that are in office. Um, so congratulations to everyone that everyone that win. I think we'll be in for another great year. We're currently looking for another Senate advisor. I don't know if we're talking about that tonight. But we'll be in the process of that because Mr. O.C. was the old Senate advisor and of course he's leaving. Mm -hmm. And that's it for the Senate report.
Thank you. Transportation report. Okay. If you recall, um, during the school year, uh, there's lots of interest in uh, our bus fleet um, seeking efficiency. Questions about the percentage of ridership, how full our buses were, uh, miles traveled, and what we could do uh, to consolidate and uh, be more efficient in, a, in, a, in, a, in our transportation system. We commissioned a study from TransFinder, which is the company that provides us the software, the, the routing software that we, that we use. And a number of recommendations came up out of that. And uh, uh, we were looking for outside, I guess, kind of national benchmarks about how, do you, how, do you, how can you assess whether or not what you're doing is right or correct or in the right way. Uh, so some benchmarks did emerge. When I reviewed the report, I reported to the board that as I looked at it, um, we would have to review this and, and come back with a further study as to what benchmarks are really applicable to Oyster River because we do have some unique rural configurations in our roads. If you have happened, I've had the opportunity to travel many of them and uh, it's, uh, it has a unique uh, transportation system. Uh, uh, routing system here because of uh, uh, the curves, uh, the low visibility. It's not uh, assist a, a district uh, embellished with many sidewalks and uh, uh, lots of visibility down the roads. So with that, I asked folks to serve on a transportation committee with me to take a look at the report. And it took the latter part of uh, the last part of the school year and so this evening, uh, Lisa uh, Huppy and Steve Woodruff and Todd Allen and Paul Wowski also uh, help. is a great help with us. But we have three people who are going to present our findings to you at this point. So, Lisa. Um, as uh, Superintendent Levesque just stated, it was a, a committee put together uh, by his request to evaluate the findings of the TransFinder report. <coughs> Um, we focused on the high school, middle school routes. Um, there was, just to keep it, I guess, easy, <laughs> easier. Um, and we had a committee members of um, Leon Levesque, uh, myself, Todd Allen, Steve Woodruff, Paul Kozowski, and Virginia Kemp. Um, the five findings from uh, the TransFinder report were that number one was that he found no formal evaluation process for walking or biking routes within one mile of the school. He questioned the need for the door-to-door -door service was the second finding. Um, the third finding was student ridership was below the optimum levels. Um, fourth was significant traffic issues at the high school middle school dismissal, slowing down the loading process, um, possibly preventing loading to capacity due to uh, the time limits between the, the two, uh, the high school middle school dismissal and the elementary dismissal. Um, and the fifth finding was opportunities exist for additional tiers of service to maximize, to maximize transportation efficiency, um, tiers being um, uh, bells. And uh, this is where Todd Allen gets in. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, myself and, and Paul Gazowski and Steve Woodruff uh, spent a, a delightful uh, Sunday in March um, uh, traveling. Uh, we, we, we looked at the, uh, the one and a half mile perimeter around the high school with a high school middle school complex at the center and basically we traced every, every walking route um, in the district uh, in that way. Uh, we utilized a, um, the evaluation tool that the TransFinder people had given to us, um, and we uh, basically, like I said, we did a, a drive over. I'd love to tell you we walked them all, but limits of time, we actually drove them uh, in order to do that. But we did we did uh, take a look at all of the, the various factors, and we were really trying to do a couple of things. One was to evaluate the walking routes, but the other was to figure out if the tool that TransFinder gave us would work for us. Um, and the results on that were kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, basically, this is a map that shows you the star in the middle is sort of like the center. If you look at the left-hand one, it's the, the, uh, the uh, area of, of the high school, middle school. 
You can't see it as well on the left-hand map, but you can see on the right-hand map in the, the kind of the violet purple color, those are all the potential walking routes that, um, um, so you can imagine driving the intricacies of all that. It took a little while. So. Um, but as we did it, we, we, like I said, we utilized, in fact, you have it in your, your back up to this, the, the packet that we utilized to evaluate. One of the things we discovered is that the, the, a lot of the, um, the evaluation tool was really geared towards a more urban setting. Uh, places that had sidewalks uh, because right away uh, we, we found you know that al almost all of our walking routes were debatable simply because there isn't a sidewalk and you're dealing with a shoulder that is questionable um, and so even even places that are I mean I'm a runner so I'm out running in the I, I, I run them all the time but when you're talking about the potential of you know four or five kids walking together to school you're still wondering, is there enough room here if a car comes along? So we, we did look at that um, and, and, and um, tried to be as objective as possible utilizing the tool. Um, just to kind of give you an idea here, this is just to, to give you some kind of illustration of the kinds of issues we're looking at. Um, uh, if you can imagine here, I shall walk over the map here. Um, this is sort of, um, this is room four here, and this is sort of the farthest out um, point that a person might walk. Um, and uh, so what we did was we looked at the potential walking from here coming down Madbury Road. If you're a middle school kid, you're going to go straight where there are sidewalks. If you're a high school kid, you're going to go here down Edgewood where there are no sidewalks and, it, and it's potentially risky. So as we, as we looked at that, we realized like, well, if you're running, if you have to run buses for high school kids because it's not safe for them to walk, then it's the question of, well, is it, are you really going to be able to consolidate because you're still, even if you say middle school kids have to walk, high school kids, well, we still have to pick them up. So that, that, that became kind of an issue that we looked at. And a lot of times that was our limitation. There are a lot of, if, if you just do that perimeter around the one and a half mile radius of the school, there's a lot of natural barriers, Route 4, railroad tracks, um, Main Street, uh, that really make it challenging to hold to a strict, you know, one and a half or two mile radius. Um, so, uh, and, and again, obviously, um, I, you know, this, this cites the, the specific laws that relate to what, what the, we're required to do um, to, to meet, um, you know, uh, uh, criteria uh, for, for bus stops and so forth. And, and um, so we, we basically were trying to find what's the, 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 the most efficient way to do it. Ultimately, um, we, we really didn't feel that there was a lot of room to consolidate, um, or to encourage, I should say, to encourage more walking, um, because the the the, uh, the natural obstacles and so forth that were there just weren't safe, and, and so we were concerned about that. Um, this is another uh, picture of. Um, am I supposed to be continuing on this one? I am. No. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when uh, creating bus routes with <coughs> bus stops, um, we need to adhere to federal and uh, New Hampshire laws, which are the RSA 189-6 and the RSA 189-8, um, which limits us as to where <coughs> the bus stops can be. 189-6 is really for a walking zone to the school for the children that they can walk up to two miles to the school as long as the route is safe. Um, our walking zone is one mile at this point because the sidewalks end all around or Route 108 or Route 4 uh, cut it off. So our walking zone for the high school middle school is one mile. Um, we also have a school bus stop criteria form that is created by the a New Hampshire Department of Safety Motor Vehicles and the New Hampshire Department of Education put together a school bus stop criteria that is used um, statewide for uh, creating bus stops. Um, so the door-to-door -door stops that we have, we do have a lot of door-to-door -door stops and they are really there because safety put them there. Um, creating a walkout bus stop, there are some walkout bus stops. When you create the walkout bus stop, you need to look at every student's walking path out to that bus stop to ensure that it is a safe walking path. Um, and here is an example. Um, this map on the left is uh, Bennett Road with Cold Springs Road coming off. 
um, you would think to put a walkout stop at the end of Cold Spring Road on Bennett Road. Um, it is not safe to do so. The uh, picture to the right is the end of Cold Spring Road looking at Bennett Road heading towards Route 108. What is behind um, is a very sharp curve. What is behind the, the uh, photographer is a very sharp curve. Um, and uh, we did put the bus stop out um, there thinking it was safe enough for the Cold Spring Road students to walk um, out to that bus stop. However, um, the uh, parents argued it and the Durham police also got involved and said it really isn't safe. They'd replaced a number of telephone poles on that road which sit just on this side of the entrance of Cold Spring Road due to the speed coming up. So it's, it's not a safe place for buses to stop. And the visibility is not the New Hampshire suggested 500 feet for the bus stop. So that's an example of one of our safety issues. Um, bus stops walking out uh, one mile. Our school district is approximately 54 square miles um, and five miles of that all around the high school and middle school is the walking zone. So 90% of our district is eligible for transportation and it's all rural. There's one sidewalk <laughs> and it's on the Packers Falls Road Bridge. There are no other sidewalks. So having, uh, again, going back to the walkout bus stops, you need to look at the safety of each student walking to ensure their, their walking path is safe to do so to the bus stop. Um, is the bus stop accessible to student walkers using sidewalks? If there's no sidewalks, there's no breakdown lanes. Um, the walking paths, uh, the state of New Hampshire form bus criteria suggests that there be a walking path on the side of the road where students to walk off the roadway a minimum of four feet wide. That's not happening either. Um, there's no crosswalks within the, the uh, transportation eligible area and there's no street lights for assistance for student walkers. And these are some examples. This is Bennett Road. Uh, this, the picture on the left has got a number of examples. The, obviously the trees. Um, foliage are very full, thick, limiting visibility. The road is very curvy. Uh, there is nowhere for them to walk on the side of the road. And in addition, the guardrails, there's a river on the other side of the guardrails and it's not a safe place. So that road, we have uh, two stops on. They're both door to door. Um, finding three is the student ridership uh, appears to be below the optimum levels. I'm talking about a 77 passenger school bus um, seats, 77 pupils, 13 inches per pupil. That's not a lot of, a lot of space. Um, federal laws and state laws um, indicate on what the ridership should be with a student ridership and adult ridership, student being 77, adult being 50 excuse me, 50 riders on, on the bus because of their size. Now, <clears throat> and that is posted on the side of the bus that comes standard, that's a, that's a federal. So what I did, um, because probably two thirds of our high school middle school routes are two to a seat, I changed our seating capacity on, in the TransFinder a program from 77 passengers on the 77 passenger buses to 50. Keeping in mind that most of our fifth and sixth grade students may be able to sit three to a seat, so that'll bring our, our seating up. And our actual rider percentage after doing that for the high school, middle school bus routes was about 80% capacity. Um, that's the average. Um, and there's always room for improvement, and there will be as students move in and out of the district, shift around, that type of thing. So. Uh, what we were putting together here was the, the finding that they said the dismissal results uh, delayed the buses, the, uh, creating longer routes. Uh, the buses, obviously this is taken from uh, the top of the hill facing the high school. The buses do come in the rear. Uh, and what they were trying to say was that if because of the delay in traffic uh, for parents uh, picking up their kids, it was it was changing the... Uh, delaying the buses and it, it really does not because the buses are on the other side of the building and parents are not allowed 
Um, this one is, uh, Todd's going to address, this is a, a survey that we had done at the, uh, by, the, by the students. Yeah, this, uh, uh, you know, this is definitely unscientific data, but this came out of, um, I shouldn't say unscientific, it's, it's not statistically um, uh, significant, thank you. Uh, it is very scientifically done. It was done by a science class, so it's done by John <laughs> Rollins. John would be mad at me if I said that. Um, but uh, basically, the, this was one of the, in fact, on, on Monday night, this was one of the projects presented uh, at the Science Showcase, uh, and they had looked at ridership patterns in the district, raising the question of what could we do to get basically fewer kids from the high school to drive to school and, and that kind of thing. And so one of the things they sought out to do was to find out, to quantify what are we talking about. Uh, obviously, they surveyed more middle school kids than they did high school kids, but um, uh, basically, they were, out of the kids they surveyed, 63% of the middle school kids indicated that they, they uh, rode the bus. High school, uh, only 28%. Um, and clearly, they did a smaller sample, although, uh, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you the number of cars that drive into our parking lot every day. Um, it's clear high school kids are much more inclined to drive themselves to school than they are to ride the bus for lots of reasons. This, the, this survey uh, uh, is in your packet in, in its complete form, and it does ask, like, what are the reasons behind it, whether they have after-school sports and that kind of stuff, and, and so that's certainly relevant um, to that. And thank you to John Brahm and his class for doing this. Uh, the other, uh, again, continuing on the uh, traffic delay, uh, dismissal results in longer routes. Uh, what we came up with um, as an option uh, was altering the bell schedules would result in longer runs. This was one of their suggestions to add another bell. Um, if we were to do that, the routes would be longer. I mean, we, we, we set the thing up in, in TransFinder and scheduled it out and it came out to rides that I, I think you're talking an hour and ten minutes for the longest ride. I, I don't think any of my kids want to ride that bus at that time. Uh, we're now looking at, we try and keep it at 40, 45 minutes maximum. Uh, some are as short as 25 depending on the routes. Um, and what they're saying here is they're, they're starting the, the clock at the first stop. It's not when they leave the yard, it's when they get to the first stop and then travel from there. Uh, and the other concern here about having them alter the bell schedules, if they went to the three bells, they, it would be a delay of, what did you say, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, which... Between the bells? Yeah, I setting think the uh, elementary school back an extra 10 minutes. I, I think that it would set back probably 15 minutes. Well, you've got elementary students getting off the bus now uh, at 4 o'clock for 15, and in the winter that's dark. I don't want my <coughs> elementary student getting off a bus in the dark. Uh, and I, that's why we just we looked at this as, as a non-issue. Um, I think it's already been addressed in previous administrations as far as the uh, adjustment of bells, trying to see if we couldn't run uh, the high school, the middle, and the elementary separately, rather than combining high school and the middle. And I, I don't think it's, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we have, uh, this again, this is why we're talking about the rural terrain and the student safety issues. That, that's our primary concern, as is yours. Uh, they've, they've been doing route consolidations based on uh, suggestions by Lisa and her staff uh, when they're looking at, I think the, the drivers support a lot of the consolidation. Uh, and they're dealing with the students directly if they're able to say, if you're able to come out to the end of the street, we can just move right along, and they're doing that. Uh, and I think they get credit for that. Um, they also have said that the, uh, they're able to consolidate the, the activity buses. If they've got numerous buses going, multiple trips, activities going on, they're trying to consolidate those where they can. Uh, and just a point of fact that they, in 2009, they did have 36 drivers. Today, they've only got 32. Um, that's, that's normal attrition that they're able to work with. The current high school, middle school routes, they've got 22 routes, 234 miles per day, uh, 358 stops. Uh, the travel time is, is, as we said, 25 to 45 minutes, depending on the routes. Uh, we're dealing with 1,335 students total, 195 live within the walking zone, 51 are out of district, 17 have special transportation. 
So we're talking about 1072 that are eligible for regular transportation and 276 uh, elect not to ride the bus. And uh, when we discussed this with Todd, uh, he said that's a very real number based on the, the students that drive in and the parking passes that are issued from the high school. And whether they've got one or two students, whether the uh, high school student is giving a, a, another high school sibling a ride or even a middle schooler a ride. That's why we don't have 276 student passes, but it's close to 200, but they're giving siblings and, uh, and whatever a ride, uh, which means that we're looking at almost 800 students in the bus system now. Fleet. That includes the five findings and of um, the bus routes, and then we'll move on to the uh, two findings of the fleet uh, for uh, that Transfinder had put in the report. A couple pictures of some of our buses and bus drivers. Um, finding number one was um, the average age of the, age of the fleet is older than expected levels. Um, and two, there were two buses in the fleet that um, were needed to be retired, basically. Um, he acknowledged that all the buses have two-way radios that's federal mandated. Um, and that the buses are clean inside, which is also driver responsibility, federal mandated. Um, finding number one, average age of, fleet, age of fleet is older than expected. Our fleet consists of six minivans, 28 school buses, and that is the breakdown um, of those school buses. Um, six of our buses are new between one and five years. 13 of them are between six and 10 years old. Um, 15 of them are between 11 and 15 years old, and two of them are 20 plus. Um, the average age of the bus is 7.92 years old, and uh, the, recommendation replace, the recommended replacement plan is uh, 10 years. Um, roughly. Uh, finding number two, there were two buses. Um, that needed to be retired immediately. They have been, they did not make it through the school year. The first one did not make it through October. Um, <laughs> the second one did not make it through uh, March, March uh, uh, inspections at John's Auto Body. Um, just too much need to go into it, keep it on the road. They're old and tired, it's time to let them go. They did get that old, I would like to add. They, we did manage to hang on to them that long because they have been in a spare bus status for a number of years. Um, used as a last resor resort, um, and we did use them often as a last resort. <laughs> um, removing them from the, the fleet uh, could limit the number of spare buses to use and uh, create some situations where service could be compromised, and it, it did. We had to do some pretty creative um, consolidations uh, for the afternoon, and some pretty good use of a very small school bus, and we, we managed to make it through. But it did create some, some uh, uh, interruption in service or uh, hairy moments, if you will. <laughs> we have the two new ones coming, and that will help correct that problem. Um, our buses are old, and um, a lot has to go into them to keep them DOT compliant. Um, John's Auto Repair does a wonderful job keeping them DOT compliant, running very well, and uh, Cooster's Auto Body also does a wonderful job on the framework of the buses, keeping them safe for our children. Um, and if I could kind of break away from that for a second, um, it, it, it ties in. Every year we have a, um, a, a driver award a banquet held in Dairyfield, the Dairyfield restaurant uh, put on by New Hampshire DOT and the NHSTA to acknowledge bus drivers for uh, safe driving in increments of five years. Um, so we went uh, and we had a, a number of awards going this year and I was very, very <coughs> surprised to find out that our fleet was acknowledged um, to uh, be the only fleet in Division Two to receive a 100%, and that's 23 fleets in Division Two, to receive a 100% on um, inspections. 
DOT inspections. That was just incredible. So I really thank John's Auto Body and Kustra's Auto Body for keeping our buses safe. And then just to acknowledge our wonderful drivers. <laughs> We have three drivers with 30 years of um, preventable accident free service. Uh, three at 25 years, five at 20, four at 15, six at 10 years, and five at five years. And I had one of my drivers point out that on the Oyster River uh, years alone, that equals to um, 350 years of service to Oyster River School District. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Um, when, I, when I was reading your report, the thing that struck me when it said the software will not create effective and actual routes and it's not designed for less rural areas. Is this the best piece of software we can get? I don't know, but it, it is. Uh, we did ha do an RFP with that and we had three demos and this was the best one out of the three that we had that, that met our needs. And Woody did a lot of talking on the phone. Uh, Steve Woodruff, sorry. Did a lot of talking on the phone um, with Transfinder to, um, you know, get all the details out of it. I what asked that question, it. <laughs> yeah, no. and it, it, it's the same thing, and I said it doesn't make sense, you know, that you're in this business, and we're not that unusual. And yeah. the woman said, well, actually you are. And she Googled us and looked at this district and saw that the roads are everywhere, and she, and I said, you know, where would you be successful? She said, well, actually, Dover, because Dover has sidewalks everywhere. Right. And, and they're, they're, all the streets are square and intersect, and they can stop at a corner and pick up a dozen people. Right. And when you look at our, uh, but they use Bing uh, uh, graphics, and, and they scoped down on us and said, you really are rural. <laughs> and I said, well, you look at what you have. Uh, I, did, I did ask that exact question. John? I'm sitting here looking at the report and I see you have a chart of the ridership yes. between elementary and secondary schools and I see you have a sample of like 22 buses. Did you look at all the different buses or just that sample? Those are the 22 high school middle school bus routes. That's okay. what those are. We're going to be looking, we looked at the high school and middle school for this because I think there's more room for any change or optimization. Uh, the Transfinder Transportation Committee is going to look further. Uh, our next project is to look at the elementary schools. I don't think there's as much we can do about that because you're dealing with a much smaller, younger audience, and you can't expect them to walk very far. You know, you're dealing with children under nine. You don't expect them to be traveling. But that's what we're looking into next. I have a question about the um, students who are walking in that quadrant. The quadrant is a lot of interest to me, actually. Because <laughs> um, they're walking down Madbury. They have to cross over, you know, several times to stay on the sidewalks. It's, you know, especially for the middle school. And I, I you know, you mentioned the safety issues. Are there, is there a solution to that, um, you know? There's a couple areas within the walking uh, zone. Um, yeah. High school, middle school, that we are looking further into, um, that we question some of the safety of possibly creating a bus stop as opposed to having them walk in. That's uh, further down the road. Okay. We're also looking at the blinking signs that remind you during the uh, arrival and dismissal yeah. time periods. That'll be a you know bus bus stop, bus crossing that, that flashes. I think that gets people's attention. Uh, the one thing that, that uh, Todd, Paul, and I picked up on on a Sunday morning uh, were the route that we had, the, uh, the matrix that we were using, kept referring to posted route. Well, the posted route and the actual route, uh, or speed route, posted uh, speed, is they're totally uh, different. Uh, we're out at, at the end of uh, Route 4, and, and or rather on uh, up by Edgewood. And the people, it's like a 35 zone. And we're just sitting there, we're making notes about, there's no one behind us, we're tracking what the sidewalks are. And they're shooting in front of us at 50 miles an hour. Right. And I, I 
my, my high school student could do it. I wouldn't want an elementary trying to cross. There is a crosswalk at the end of Edgewood. But um, I think if we can bring to the attention that as people come off the highway, they're hitting that, and it's, it's their high speed, and they haven't slowed down yet. If we can get something that would say, you know, school zone uh, and, a, and a blinking strobe light, I think it would get their attention, and it might slow them down. I know, yeah. Okay. They love that speed tables. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, we we did um, when we did, uh, analyzed the routes. We did talk about, um, you know, we're obviously we're looking at it as it currently stands. You know, in terms of mm -hmm. sidewalks, crosswalks, things like that. Is there room for potential improvements? Adding sidewalks, adding crosswalks, adding sign. Definitely, but obviously that is a, a, a another cost factor, and it and it would uh, and I know certainly the town of Durham as they're I know they're building their library and I know they're going to be looking at trying to maximize walking traffic along that stretch. I'd like to think there'll be some look at that as a, a more long term thing. Um, right now, like, like we agreed, we kind of asked like, would I want my kid walking here? And and, and that was sort of our. Well, I know in that neighborhood well, and I know parents drive their kids to the middle school because they're concerned, you know. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, students from university in general, people are speeding down that, I mean, it is, it's really, you know, if a kid is on his bike, if, if there was an accident, I mean, it would be so easy to have mm -hmm. an accident. And um, anyways. Do we know how many of the parents or high school students are driving themselves or their children to the school because they don't feel it's safe for their child to walk? Did I ask that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the answer is we don't know that. No, we don't. No, we really don't know that. One of those surveys might have been that I didn't care to That would be an interesting thing to know is how many people are driving their student to school because they don't feel it's safe. I, I, I Just speaking anecdotally, having listened to middle school and high school kids complain for years, um, it's, it's it, for the kids, oftentimes it's about not wanting to spend the time on the bus uh, and, and like right. you know, mom and dad can drive me here and I'm here in five, ten minutes. If I take the bus, it's going to be half the course of an hour depending on what the route happens to be. And that, that often is the case. There's also a number of things happening before school, within the school, right. getting into the drop off at the school prior to the buses arriving. So that also plays a role. Mm -hmm. well. Uh, my question. Go ahead. I, I oh, my question was. Uh, I know. I think it was last year. There were some changes in the routes, mm -hmm. and uh, oh my gosh, I called actually to find out where the bus stop was supposed to be, and it sounded mm -hmm. like you guys had taken an amazing amount of abuse. Um, um yeah. And so, is there, <laughs> is there any way? A that, smile. <laughs> I know you smile. And given that you know, as I read through the report, like your brain is our local trans finder and we need that. Is there a more effective way we can communicate the changes that have happened so you guys take less heat? I don't know. I'm open to ideas. Go <laughs> <laughs> the website. But wasn't There's part of the way. issue last year is that we had difficulty uh, uploading the website in time mm -hmm. and we had to make hard copies Yes. Uh, of the routes and that, of, that's, of the start that's of now, the school year, yes. I think that that's rectified because it all happened at once the software, mm -hmm. the changes, mm -hmm. and trying to put it up on the website and it fell through. And mm -hmm. there were some problems with the uploading. Mm -hmm. And so then we had to go back to plan B, uh, which, which is the hard plan. copies, and, get, and that was a mess out of our office trying to get all that communication out. Mm -hmm. But I think that should be rectified for this fall. Yeah, well, I'm, I would like to play, uh, post it in, in both places. I would still like to utilize the, the uh, web portion of the, the software, but I would also plan on posting it in the Fosters as well and on the website. Wise. So I, I think when you look at this study, uh, the conclusion is there are no easy answers. <laughs> um, I think Lisa, the bus drivers, and Sue, the folks, consolidate where we can. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the pieces that came to light too is that uh, there are a number, I mean we are required to provide the transportation to students and have that capacity to provide it. Some choose to use the transportation on certain days and they choose not to use it on other days. Uh, we're still, if they choose to use it on the day that they want it, we need to be there 
and have the capacity mm -hmm. to provide that service, okay? So uh, <coughs> there, there, we have to have um, a bus fleet that can accommodate what we're required to do for transportation. Uh, the, other, the other piece is that we consolidate where we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have an aging fleet, which we're trying to keep uh, tabs on, and uh, looking at uh, the safety of children relative to the roots is, has to be the primary concern whenever exactly. we what we do. So uh, I commend, uh, I really want to thank the group for plowing through this all year long, uh, I guess for half of the year with me, and for the brave souls that went out and actually walked the roots and drove <laughs> the roots and observed and try to really get a handle on this. Uh, there's nothing like actually going out and walking and seeing through your own two eyes. And then they came back and really uh, stated that uh, we're doing probably the best we can right now. One of the other aspects that came out is that even though the, the trans finder said that at the um, secondary level, there should be something like, what, 66% mm -hmm. ridership and 77 in the That's elementary. a desirable, um, but our rural terrain prevents that from consolidating. But when you look at uh, the issue that uh, really looking at putting 77 kids on a bus, mm -hmm. middle school, high school, that's th with the size of those kids, it just doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, so when you put it at a ridership of two per seat, then our capacity goes way up mm -hmm. uh, to much more uh, meeting the benchmark. Right. Uh, so that's the other thing that came out uh, mm -hmm. with it. Uh, and I know that there is interest, too, at the high school to look at, uh, I mean, a side, a side issue is what do we do to reduce the traffic flow of the high school? Can we increase more ridership on the part of kids? It's all part of the, of the work the Sustainability Committee has been doing. Uh, can we look at mass transportation and enhance that type of transportation for our kids? And, and one of the things we know is that you can't, you can't increase the bus route and think you're going to be doing that. I mean, the time in the bus route. So uh, where we are right now is probably the max uh, that we can do on some of these routes, but there are probably going to be some work. We're going to, I know Todd, <coughs> the group will be approaching uh, students at the high school to see if there's some interest in uh, looking at ways to increase ridership. <coughs> is there any, um, does the UNH transportation system work at all with the, um, Voice to River students, or would that be a possibility just to encourage rider bus ridership for well, kids I mean, who need to? We, we do have, like, for example, um, our, our photography uh, class did a field trip to Portsmouth and they were able to take the coast. They, they did that. They took the coast bus to do that. Um, but in terms of working in conjunction with transporting our students to and from school, um, I mean, you could probably speak it's to that. It's something I've never that. checked into. Um, <coughs> It's something I could check into to see what the options are. So at, that, at this point, I don't know if there are options there. I mean, it's something like just getting a bus, like a UNA students have a bus pass, then maybe mm -hmm. Oyster River kids could have a bus pass too, which would not only allow them to maybe take the bus to school, but also take the bus to Dover or Portsmouth or you know, not have to drive. I don't think that it, you're talking about using the Wildcat Transit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it probably, unless they change their bus stops, I don't believe there's a bus stop near the high school or the middle school, so they wouldn't even be dropped off on campus. Right, except unless there was a big ridership. You know, if there was enough um, demand, they might want to give a, put a route here. Um, Something to check into, see what the options are. If there are no more further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have the immigration project. I have to take a side trip in my role as the search person. <laughs> Mass way. Um, there's a missing person here tonight who is probably the most important key person in this triumvirate, the three of us here, um, Susan O'Byrne, and she unfortunately can't be here. Um, I'm going to try to get a website up in a minute, and I'm going to let Beth speak for both Susan and herself. Uh, but a, um, um, t two summers ago, we <coughs> had a to acquire funds to um, create an immigration project 
And it, in retrospect, it really is a good example of what a project can do to address several common core standards in um, reading, in art, in social studies, and even science, um, and writing. Most importantly, writing. She's going to make sure I say writing, because writing is part of it. Um, but what we did essentially was partner with um, the Webster School in Manchester and Moharamet School. And we, Webster School in Manchester has um, a cohort of immigrants um, from about 17 different countries. And we um, partnered with those, with that school and our school. And the um, people, the, the children in the, in the Webster School created the stories of their immigration to the United States anywhere from a year and a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, quite incredible. Our students, mean, meantime, um, went home and quizzed their parents. Where did, where did grandma come from? Where did you come from? And created their own stories. Beth's going to talk about that. I'm going to try to be the tech expert and get a website up, uh, which will probably do a better job than I have explaining exactly what we did. But um, Beth will explain what uh, the project entailed. And um, then I'll come back in. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Beth Olshansky. And about 22 years ago at the Oyster River Elementary School, I began experimenting um, with the dynamic relationship between pictures and words, art and writing. And in fact, um, Tom Newkirk's son was in the first, he was in the first grade in the first classroom I was in um, and created a beautiful handmade book. Um, the thinking being that many students are hands-on visual learners and particularly boys are often hands-on visual learners. I know Ken had been concerned about boys and uh, their academic progress. And that when you give children the opportunity to create images first, they do an awful lot of thinking ahead of time while they're actually constructing story. And in this case, these images, this is one of the projects uh, that I developed are processes, image making within the writing process which is created from hand-painted papers that each student made, and they actually construct story. So the idea of constructing story is not a metaphor any longer. It's a reality. As they move shapes on the page, they get to rehearse, draft, and revise their story before they ever put glue to it and before they ever begin writing. And then there's the process of oral rehearsal, reading the pictures to access detail and description. Um, over the years, I've had the good fortune of uh, having several f f federally funded research studies conducted on uh, this and my other art-based literacy model. And we've had great success, um, especially with the at-risk students, the Title I kids, the special ed kids, the English language learners for whom pictures are a universal language. Um, and boys, and I don't mean to set them in an at-risk group, but you know, we, we know that nationally boys are about a year and a half behind girls uh, in terms of their writing skills. Dennis is uh, almost there, but I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> I, the federally funded study I was last involved in was in Manchester in a school that had a, a large ELL population, and so I had the opportunity to work with those students. Um, when I came over to Moharamet, and the first question I asked Susan O'Byrne's third graders was, where did you come from? Of course, almost every single child said Madbury, New Hampshire, um, because there's just so, their, their, aunt, their families had been there so long, it was no longer part of the family discourse. Um, so it was a really exciting opportunity for them to conduct family research and uh, learn about where their ancestors came from. One of the things Susan did that was most clever was 
After they researched their family background, she seated them in table groups by country and in that way developed little ethnic neighborhoods. So all the kids who originated from Russia were sitting together and all the kids from Ireland were sitting together. And they started comparing notes and finding out that their ancestors came for similar reasons. And when they met the students from um, Manchester, they discovered that those kids came for many of the similar reasons as well, whether it was uh, religious persecution or not enough food. So Dennis is at the site. Let's see if we can um, put this mic near. This was um, a film by New Hampshire Chronicle, Cindy Jeff Jones, uh, that was aired on Channel 9 on Thanksgiving of last year. Can I first see this country? Oh, it's like Can you hear it? Yeah. Uh, how do you do the volume? What generation no. Oh, here's the volume. Here we go. Okay. Right. Is this? And where is the speaker on this? Because in the pictures, I 
and you don't really have to think about, oh, this has to fit the words. The power of it to elicit story, to elicit detail, to elicit imagination. This process is not just make a picture and write about it. Um, first of all, the invitation to create all those beautiful hand-painted papers. Wow, do I like it? Many of the students uh, that are in the Webster ELL program have come from refugee camps or are in situations where they had to flee very quickly from their country. Many of them had never been exposed to paints before. You could see those students just dive into that painting experience with great delight. It really does facilitate the writing process and learning that way. So it's great for that separate student academically. And then if you're working in a collaboration with two groups who are unfamiliar with each other, the art becomes a common language. Well, I learned that many different people immigrated for, for many different reasons, maybe like a drought or, or not enough money. On my country, everybody was, was keeping dying because water and food and killing people. That's why I came here. We were all immigrants, and the bravery and courage of their ancestors is why they're here today, and that there are children today not that far away from, from their own community that are going through that same situation and, and having that bravery and courage. I don't know how much they think of their journey until they go through this process. I think that was somehow very healing to them. In, in a way, it created some distance between themselves and the event. It was not anymore about the horror of this event. It was about, how can I show other people what happened? People came across were very brave and because I couldn't really imagine doing that myself. I think that our students now, they understand even more how fortunate they are to be citizens of the United States. There is a lot to be proud of, and the biggest thing to be proud of is the mix of people that has made this country great. Now, <clears throat> Susan, uh, Beth and I have spent this year taking this information and spreading it. We've been to the principal's um, convention in uh, January, we went to the ASCD convention in um, Philadelphia, and I'm not going to go to the last one because I'm going to be elsewhere. Um, but she and, and hopefully Susan will be going to the um, state principals um, convention uh, at the end of the year this year. And um, this project, what you've seen. This, what you've seen, what you've seen here was last year's project. It was replicated this year, and it will go on. And we, one of the interesting things we did was, uh, good Lord, we discovered that something similar and just as great was happening at Mast Way. And so Susan brought her kids over to the simulation that uh, Mast Way does yearly on immigration. And we're going to try to put those two ideas together. Um, so it really, there, there are a lot of rewards, um, um, and it, it really does fit, and, and I, I, I've been talking to Beth for about a month and a half now, is that we, we really need to see and attach this work and other work to the Common Core, because it will really be um, um, encouraging to see how much you can put together in, in, in a curriculum way. One of the interesting things that goes through my mind is we had an assistant superintendent about seven years ago who analyzed all of the stuff in the curriculum and said that children would probably graduate at 27 from high school if we did everything that was in the curriculum. So um, the Common Core makes a lot of sense. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll pass around uh, our website if you want to watch that video again and hear it better. Um, thank you.
and also some of the research findings from the federally funded Manchester study are are on the website. Um, some really interesting findings about at-risk students and our male population. <laughs> Thank you for the oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Mr. Harrington. May I ask a question? I didn't get to ask a question. Sorry. For Beth. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. I, I just, when I look at the illustrations and the, the style, it reminds you a lot of Eric Carle. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, is that, was that well, part of your um, inspiration? Well, truthfully, 22 years ago when I first um, got a small grant from the New Hampshire State Council of the Arts to go into the classroom to explore what I then thought was going to be an illustration component to the writing process, um, the classroom at uh, Oyster River Elementary School had chosen Eric Carl as author illustrator for the month of September. So I thought we would develop something around the collage. Of course, I have to say the first and second graders I work with improved greatly on his techniques. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually in a subsequent first grade class, they decided to write Eric Carl a letter because the students learned that when they pick their background paper for their collage, it tells about the time of day or the weather. It's the sky. And they noticed that Eric Carle's illustrations are off, often on white backgrounds. And mm. so they wrote him a letter to ask him why, why did he do that? Because you couldn't tell the time of day in the story. <laughs> yeah. He didn't respond, uh, however. Oh, well. um, and I'll just make one more comment. This is really the reverse of writing and then illustrating, if that wasn't clear. This is making pictures first to allow kids to have those all essential visual thinking skills. Um, and from my perspective, uh, having traveled around the country quite a bit with this and uh, also across Canada, you always are seeing how in, in our current educational system, we bifurcate everything, and the art is in a special that's 40 or 45 minutes a week, and it doesn't belong in the classroom. And, and I think the missing piece that we fail to notice is that when kids do art, it requires a tremendous amount of visualization, and it is exactly those skills that allow children to visualize what they're reading. Comprehension is based on visualizing the words, and also to become an effective writer, you need to be able to picture in your mind what you want to say so that you can find the words to paint pictures in the reader's mind. So that core piece of visualization is essential to literacy learning and, and uh, you know, of course, obviously I'm an advocate for bringing art into the, the literacy classroom. Um, you may be aware, and you'll be happy to know, that a number of years ago, I think it was Mrs. Engstrom and another teacher team taught um, a class, I believe, with the art and, and writing or social studies and something else that brought these components together in a very mm -hmm. similar way. And I'm sorry I'm reaching for what the two subject matters were, but I know there must be someone here in the room that remembers. <laughs> but, but it was this, along the same lines of thinking that you take it to a, a, um, a typical way of delivering education, mm -hmm. and you you try and and um, dovetail it with other subject matter to make a, a new relevance. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's very popular. Class. Yes, and for those students who are perhaps struggling readers or reluctant writers, it can really be uh, an important doorway into being successful <coughs> and having visual tools that are going to support their literacy learning. And one other comment. Um, probably in the grant, we wrote in like three days for Beth to uh, consult with us. And with Manchester, she probably did 35 days. And uh, so I guess that's as a community member. And that's quite a contribution to the community. Hard to stay away when there's such exciting work going on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Moving right along to the world, languages.
Well, I must say this has been a journey and fun, but I feel like um, I'm back where uh, we're back where we started. Um, uh, after um, the winter vacation, and I tried to give because most of you, uh, several of you, are new. I tried to put as much information together as I could uh, about where, what's happened. And I guess maybe I should just briefly go through how I got into this. I was asked about a year ago to go to a meeting and, and help uh, find a, a um, French-Spanish teacher four tenths of a position, and there weren't a good there, were, there weren't a, there wasn't a good candidate, so we didn't hire anyone. So then I was asked to look at what we should do going down the road, and I said sure. Um, and so we gathered a group of people together and we spent some time um, visiting one school in Boston and then another, uh, we had plans to see two more schools and then we got this letter from the Confucius Center um, in, um, right after the uh, winter break saying that um, the opportunity that we had for this upcoming year would not be there because there was some trouble with visas. And so I asked why, what was the trouble? Well, they couldn't tell me. So I then communicated with Jean Shaheen, with Senator Shaheen and outlined what the issues were because I wanted to make sure we weren't in the middle of a political mess. And so she very graciously took uh, some, a period of time and put some of her personnel on it. And what had, what had happened is the Confucius Center had applied for the in, improper visa. And so they have to go, they've gone back now and are correcting that. So the possibility of us having Mandarin in the mix is still there, but it's delayed a year. Um, and the um, information that we've, we've collected, for, uh, we, we did come up with a model that I'm not satisfied with superintendent's not satisfied with, but it's a start. Um, there are a lot of questions to be asked. If we simply take the Mandarin option off the table, we're talking about a lot of dollars to um, bring uh, a foreign language into the element, uh, world language into the elementary school. So there's a lot of more work that needs to be done. As an educator, I think it's, I don't know what adjective to use, almost inexcusable that it's 2012 and our youngest children are not being exposed, at least exposed, to a language other than English. And yet we're not there. Uh, we need to keep at it. Um, I, I'm certainly willing to stay at it. Um, we need to do some more visitations. The superintendent um, recommended, and I don't know why I didn't think of this. We're, we're in, where are we? University of New Hampshire? Maybe they know something about um, world languages and how to implement it. And so we need to explore that. We need to um, um, visit uh, the school on the other side of the state that um, have, um, has recently um, done a study of what they were doing in the elementary schools and offered to have us come in halfway through May. I called them up and said, we can't come because there's this little thing of a principal search going on and I have some other stuff to do. Uh, but there's no reason why we can't move forward with the planning. I tried to put some figures in front of you so that you could see how expensive it would be without bringing Mandarin in the mix and without looking at world languages holistically, K through 12. And my colleague over here has been uh, instrumental in helping to look at all of this and to um, have his staff integrate with Mastway staff and Moharamit staff and middle school staff to keep looking at this issue. We don't have a solution, but we sure as I Probably was going to use some stronger language, but I won't. Um, we will stay at it until we find, until we have a recommendation, and hopefully we will have some form of recommendation to this new superintendent during the budget season next year. 
and I just hope uh, that before um, I leave this district, which is sort of selfish, that um, that um, world languages begin being taught in the elementary school because it's not in in this day and age it's just not right that it's not happening. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your yes. work. I just have a Don Graves question yeah. that I hope you address. Yeah. That if you put something in, what do you take out? That that is a good question. I mean, that's the major issue that the staff has over it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and, I'm and not saying there's, there's you know, yeah, be something the, to take out, but you can't keep putting things in. It's and not an, taking it's an interesting out. question. I mean, it, it, it's it, it's the same. Is that 27? You know, mm -hmm. age 27. Yeah. Um, okay. But the analogy there would be, yeah. how do other countries do it? Yeah. What amazes me is that every time I meet a foreign, um, yeah. one of our, some yeah. of our students, like there are a lot of students that came from Russia this year, yeah. they spoke three languages. Yeah. 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 And in, in my travels, particularly in Europe, uh, around Holland and, and those particular areas, when I mean, you meet students uh, or adults, it's very common for them to have three languages. And, and I don't know how they how they how do they do that within their educational system. Mm -hmm. So maybe it comes back again to some of the integration and mm -hmm. not. It does. Uh, and and I notice right now even in our schools, I mean the wonderful projects that our teachers are doing with languages. I was just at one the other day at Massway where there was, uh, there were, I believe it was a grade three, uh, was doing French, mm -hmm. uh, and students were doing uh, skits in French. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's possible. We probably need to look at other models and how they've done it. I can tell you how I did it in Europe. We went to school until 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the end on Saturdays. So you could put in well, a few languages. Yeah. I, I think you've hit on something. School should be longer. Um, find out a financial way to do that and we'll do it. Um, and, and I don't mean longer to do the same stuff. I mean, longer to create something like we saw in Boston, where the the, uh, the um, charter school there, uh, the, the school day is longer. There are a lot more options. It's not just for regular curriculum. Well, every curriculum is considered regular, which is what where we should be headed in the long run when you talk about 21st century schools. I was I was fortunate to get to go on the trip to Boston mm -hmm. to the Renaissance Charter School, and um, you know that you have to really be ready to integrate the language into the classroom. And, and you look around the classrooms, we saw there was Chinese, you know, on the walls, and even the teachers, the regular classroom teachers, I had to sort of learn some Chinese too to a certain degree. So it's a commitment and it's to make it really successful and and those kids were learning Chinese it was really impressive mm -hmm. um, as someone who studied Chinese I can tell you it's very difficult to learn but these children were speaking with very good proper pronunciation which is is something that's very hard to do when you're not in China immersed in the culture so it is possible it's just a, a very big commitment to, make and, it happen. And to, to further address Tom's question one of the questions I asked when we were there well how did the when this happened, how did it happen? Were the teachers enthusiastic? The answer was no. For the same reason. Where did we where where were they gonna put it? But they did. And what once it once it generated, once they once it got into the day the working day, then after they saw the success, they were much more supportive of it. But it, it is a real question, um, um, when you uh, looking all at all of the stuff that needs to be taught um, and what and that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about Common Core although some some in my profession are not very excited about it I think it has the potential to answer some of these questions yeah yeah let me start I, first of all I am terrible at foreign languages I hate to admit this on TV it's amazing that I've traveled I've been, as far st as I've been still do. working on English. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like it's but uh, I just had a lot of I mean I'm sure you guys also have a lot of questions about uh, the Confucius Institute uh, one I was like are we it said like five years are we what if the teacher comes here and they're terrible? Do we get to turn them over? Is there like a new teacher? You yes. The, you mean in the Mandarin thing? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we have. We would have the ability to, after six months, say, 
this is all, this is done, this is not working. Right. Well, mm -hmm. could they send us another teacher? Or they, they could, could. yeah. I guess all this is to be worked yeah. out, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the Yiji, um, who is, is the person at the Confucius Center I've been communicated with, communicating with regularly, is currently in China, and he's at the school that would be our partner school, looking at who the teachers are there. So it's all still on the burner. It's right. all still a possibility. But we've got a lot of spade work still to do. Yeah, it, okay. it, it, it's not as easy as it looks. But the, the, the uh, bottom line is there's no excuse for us, and this is a personal, professional point of view, not having uh, a, a world language integrated into somehow into our curriculum. I don't know what we squeeze out or what we squeeze in or what we change about what we do, as the superintendent would suggest. Um, but it, it needs to happen. Well, would you relate uh, how quickly you're going to learn Chinese? Um, I'm going to, about two, two weeks from now, I'll, I'll be fluent. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can I go home now? Thank you, Dennis. School, school board committees. Anybody? Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, I can't remember the date, I attended a meeting at the Stratford Learning Center with Phil Schlichter. Is Phil still here? No, I think she's gone. Um, and it was with representatives from each school district. It, uh, it's an annual meeting to get to know representatives from other school districts. It typically um, invites the superintendent, the director of uh, special education and a school board member from each district to attend and the, the the direction of the meeting was for the Stratford Learning Center to examine its mission and what it saw its future to be because it's growing exponentially and it needs to decide does it continue to grow or does it does it rein in and, and just maintain the, the districts it's currently working with and the subject areas that, the, that it works in and not subject area but it was, a, it was a very interesting meeting. It's an amazing organization, and we're very fortunate to have it um, as our arm for our preschool program um, and, and as an arm to provide other special education services. Thank you. Any other committees? I um, met with the Sustainability Committee last night, and um, they're working on compost and trying to figure out a way to get that... Um, how to, how to maybe put that into the recy whole recycling pri um, system of the school or other ways of doing it. So a lot of interesting discussion there. That's great. I'm a master composter. State of Maine, though. Um, board comments. Moving right along. Discussion items, we don't have any. Action items, approve additional video production class at Oyster River High School. Mr. Allen. I just wanted to start out by just talking a little bit about our video production program as a general thing. Um, we have, uh, uh, currently we offer video production one, video production two, and then uh, kids that want to go beyond that um, are set up with various independent studies that they do. And, and, and some of our kids have been very successful. In fact, on June 16th, right? June 16th, we have uh, uh, six of our students who have been uh, made it to the uh, New Hampshire State Film Festival. Uh, their their, their uh, um, videos are going to be uh, part of a, the, uh, um, a competition there. So they had clearly had to advance some very rigorous uh, competition to get there. Um, very exciting stuff watching these kids pull these videos together it's just it's very very exciting and inspiring to see it going on and they've done that under what I would consider to be some some limitations um, what we would like to be able to do and you should have a proposal before you uh, is we'd like to be able to offer a basically a video three class um, our working working title of that class is ORTV news um, now, the, the, basically, the concept here is if you've had a chance to, to, to see some of the products that our kids do, um, they produce like the uh, Bobcat News, things of that sort that show up on our, our website, they show up on, on DCAT. Um, 
and they in many ways tell the community a lot about our school and what is going on. What we would like to be able to do by offering this, this um, video three or ORTV news is to have a class that would be a year long class for kids that are really um, have already advanced through the two levels of video production and have really begun to master those skills to be able to be involved in producing some really high quality stuff that we see it as being um, as much in the benefit of the school district as, as it is in the benefit of the kids. Uh, I would envision this being, for, uh, you, know, you, you see it, uh, for example, at the deliberative session every year, all of the video production kids that are doing the shooting of that to put it on, on TV, um, and to be able to get out there and to do some, some more uh, finished products of videos that are uh, largely geared towards informing the community about what's going on in our school. And, and I think, I mean, I served on the, uh, the communications committee within the strategic plan process. And that was certainly one of the things we talked a lot about was how do we communicate to our community as to how that, um, what's going on in our schools so people know the good stuff that's going on. Our hope in creating this class is that we would be able to create a more structured opportunity. Right now, basically, uh, Kathleen is working with kids in independent studies kind of in a hodgepodge. You know, if you, if you come here during the day, you'll see kids are in and out of here all the time working on video projects, but it's not, as focused and efficient a use of time as it could be if it were able to be offered as a class. Right now, our video one and video two classes have around 11 or 12 kids each in them. Maximum you can have, because of just the equipment that we have, is 12. So we're, th those classes are very popular. Um, in fact, Kathleen's running a, a video club at the middle school, and there's some interest that's developing there. We have eight kids that would be interested and available and likely to sign up for this video production class. Now, in order to, obviously the, the economic question is we're talking about adding .2 FTE to the high school teaching staff. Now, on a, if you look at it purely from the standpoint of staffing, you say, oh, that's an increase in staff. It actually is simply, in my mind, it's a, um, an opportunity to make the, the, the job more efficient. It's actually, Kathleen is already doing much of this. By making it a designated class, if you look at this breakdown of the dollars, it actually ends up saving the district $500. It's, it's actually less expensive to do it this way because it's simply many of the tasks that are currently under the category of things that, um, uh, for example, creating video content to put on the website, things of that sort, which are part of the job description that, that Kathleen works under, could become student-based projects. And, and to me, it would be a, a tremendous a PR opportunity for the school and also a great opportunity for our kids who are really motivated in video production to have some real opportunities and real audiences. You may have noticed we got a, we've got we added a couple of uh, video monitors, one in the core, one in the cafeteria, and our hope is to be able to produce some real regular news content that can be run on those so that kids can be made more aware of what's going on in their school. Community members coming into the school can be more aware of what's going on in our school. Um, and so really we're, we're, we're trying to look down the road. I mean, uh, video technology is the way the world is going and we would like to be able to offer that in a more cohesive way. And, and so this proposal that I'm, I'm asking for your approval on tonight is really about trying to uh, provide an opportunity for kids at the same time of making things more efficient uh, for for Kathleen and video production. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Are there, I mean, are there any plans to, with that video three to eventually get stuff up on channel 23? So like, can we do that? Is that 22, you mean? Or 22, I'm sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, as it is, there's a lot of the content that is produced by our video production kids that goes up there. Right. Um, I, but with kids out front. Right. With, you, know, you know, certainly we're envisioning a regular, possibly a bi-weekly news program where you're c covering all the main events of the school, uh, and absolutely those could be, uh, in fact, I, I would hope that that would be one of the main audiences, and maybe Kathleen would like to talk about that. Well, I, I was just going to add that it looks as if we're going to have our own station anyways, um, because we're separating from the town, so we would need more content. And I would love to start it in a way that we have a regular news presence. So now I think people aren't always sure what's on 22 and when they can see district events, and this would be a very organized schedule. So they know Mondays at 6 p.m. they're going to hear that. You know, I don't know exactly, yeah, but I would, I would love to have the station kick off with some regularly scheduled programming. If I could just comment, um, I'm still in conversations with Comcast to try to acquire 
um, a station that's dedicated to the school department. Okay, so I, I hope to get some some definitive information by the end of the month. Uh, but one of the selling points we've made to them is that this would give an opportunity for many more broadcasts to occur. It could be athletic events, could be art event, artistic events, uh, uh, student uh, creative projects. Uh, and so we, we could have uh, a site that uh, celebrates uh, video production uh, in addition to uh, school board meetings. <laughs> right. And I think, I think like Todd said, that some of, some of that is that some of it's being done right now, but it's buried. Nobody knows where they can see it. Yeah. Um, I have students who did something on the art show, um, a student that did something on Science Night, um, on the Power of One. And that'll all go up and that'll be on, but I'm not sure how many people will see it and know that the students are creating it. So I would love to have, you know, a container around what we show and have it more organized? Um, it, our, within our community, I often hear from folks who live in Lee and Madbury that they have to get a copy of our meetings, our school board meetings, because they can't access DCAT. We're working that, on that right now with Comcast to, to have, have it available to the three communities. And that, that's the problem right now. Well, is that within the negotiations of each town well, to make yeah, that choice? Yeah, so well, is I'm, it, trying I, my push it, I'm trying to push it in one one group. I mean, they're negotiating with Durham right now, and I'm trying to get them to conv convince them that Lee and Madbury need to be part of that, whatever they do. So I haven't heard that. From the impression, Newmarket, though, there's a lot of Newmarket people that see our incapacity. It was my understanding that Lee and <laughs> right. um, it's it's not, Madbury did. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, there are places, I think, in Lee and Madbury that right. get it. It's it's just but not, not everybody. So I'm just wondering is, that that's the towns, which is the town's purview to, to, to make that happen, or is right. it something we can do here, which is no, I think it's a can negotiation. Do it. yeah. If they're convinced that we have an audience and that we're going to do a good job of it, that's what I'm working on. Right, and they also want to know that if they give us another channel, which sounds like it will happen, that we'll have enough content. And I would just like to add that, you know, I'm one person and, you know, I worked at a television station. Like, I can produce the content, but why not have the students do it? And why not teach them how to do it? And then they're part of the information and they're part of um, getting out and learning how to do it. You know, I can do it, but, it, you know, I can only be at one event where if I have you know, eight plus students that can be at eight events and working on different things, so. Uh, one of the responsibilities that would not be shifted over would be the um, school board meetings for DCAT. Would somebody, pick that, would somebody else pick that up or would there be any cost in somebody else picking that up? Well, that would be still counted. I mean, we're still maintaining some portion of Kathleen's job that is servicing the district with okay. broadcast so that and would, the website. That would continue that. So that would continue. Okay. A portion of the job that we're really talking about is, is that sort of okay. facilitating some of this production of programs. So would our meetings be on DCAT and on this channel, or would the, our meetings just be on DCAT? Right. Our meetings would just be on DCAT. Okay. We'll, so it'll be an educational um, channel devoted just to Oyster River. So Comcast, is, will they remedy? I don't have it all worked out yet. I just want them to make a commitment they're going to give us the channel to the three communities. We haven't. Right. But that doesn't that solve out. the problem of people in the community not being able to see the school board meeting if they want to. Right. So I'm just. Yeah. I, I mean, think that's so, under so negotiation. I don't think folks it realize may be a that possibility a of having everything, <laughs> even the school board meetings, on that channel. It hasn't been all worked out. Don't know. Right. Well, um, it's part of PEG, which is public educational government, and in communities all over the country, it really exists. So. Um, I hear your point. I'll definitely bring that up. You know, making sure that's part of the negotiation. I'm just yeah. Why it's the case. Right. Why it would even be? I, I I I haven't heard that, so I'm not sure how many people don't get DCAT or folks on Fresh It. <laughs> I can give you a screen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the course. I'm just kind of interested to understand. Um, when you describe, when Todd described what you would be doing with your class, it really seems like it's a multidisciplinary type of course. I mean, you're, you're in, you know, had writing, probably journalistic, you know, exactly. artistic, um, you know, theatrical maybe, you know, right. a lot of fine arts, uh, bring in a lot of different disciplines. So where, if I were a student in, the, in Oyster River High School and I want to take your class, what credits is it 
what department? You actually get an art credit. We get an art credit. Right. Okay, I was curious well, about that. One of the things that I think it's a really interesting opportunity, and I know Sh Sean Kelly, who's the um, uh, uh, who runs Mouth of the River, our student newspaper, is very interested in working with Kathleen. In fact, they already have quite a bit mm -hmm. this year to integrate those two media. So and and uh, so certainly, looking down the road, I could see it all possibly being an English credit as well, depending on how we chose to structure it. Right now, it's very specifically a video production class, but absolutely, you know, you're talking news production, you're talking writing, writing the, the, the copy for mm -hmm. the program. It, it very definitely could head in that direction. The other element is almost, a, I don't know, it would be like a business element where you're learning project management skills that are very useful in life down the road. I, don't I, I think they experienced that starting in video one, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. just project management and deadlines and how to keep a, a, a creative process going. But yeah, you're right about that for sure. Okay. And um, I think there are a lot of students who are interested in broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. So the students who are working on Mouth of the River have um, expressed interest in doing more broadcast, not just written. So they would have a place for both of those um, interests. Just to follow up to Megan's question, would you ever see yourself team teaching with an English teacher like Mr. Kelly in a class like that? We, we do that now. We've had several um, projects. We um, had a project actually that Joe participated in. We went to UNH and interviewed um, students and faculty on the experience of what students um, go through when they leave high school and go to college. And um, his students did the journalistic part of it and we um, were the videographers, kind of the producer, director side of it, and we edited the content that they went out and researched. So there's definitely overlap there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I mean, my dream would be to do even um, screenwriting, um, all, all different types of projects, and I would collaborate. Collaborate, yeah, I've talked to the theater department on having um, teaching classes for, um, you know, getting theater majors involved in acting for television, you know, so I see a lot of opportunity. Great, thank you. Tom. I'd just like to move that we approve uh, this uh, change in responsibilities for Kathleen Young, as defined here. You wanted just to, to add the class, is that what you want your motion to say? Uh, okay, move to expand the duties of Kathleen Young to develop a uh, video three class, is that? Yeah. I think, I think you wrote the, the motion is, out the key in is our it's motion packet. From a point four FTE to a point six FTE. So, so the motion is already written out. So yeah. this <laughs> needs to be. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, a, it's to approve the additional video production class at ORSH. So moved. Mm -hmm. okay. Moved by Tom. Seconded by Al. Can you repeat for me? You repeat. I don't know. It's on the right. To approve, motion is to approve the additional video production class at Oyster River High School. It doesn't need to say anything about adding the point F to it's, it's, it's in the detail. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Could we have a show of hands, please? Six in the affirmative. Motion passes. Thank you. I just want to thank Kathleen for being willing to take this on because I think it is going to be a real service to our kids but also to our school district. Great. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now we have um, accept the resignation of Mr. Dollar from the ABC. I'd like to make a motion to accept the resignation of Phil Dollar from the ABC. Moved by Al, second by Ed. Discussion? Hearing none, could we have a show of hands, please? Six in the affirmative, motion passes. You were psychically reading it. She was And we did have uh, another applicant, Mr. Wayne Burton. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, to whatever accept <laughs> Wayne Burton uh, on the ABC. Moved by Al, second by 
Uh, it should be clarified that uh, in the motion that is for the remaining two-year term, 2012-2014. Yes, I thought okay, I heard you. him say that. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion? Could we have a show of hands, please? Six in the affirmative. Motion passes. Approve re uh, revision of policy BEDB. Okay. Um, in conversations with the vice chair, um, I think this conversation has emerged previously that it has been the practice for the vice chair to sit in agenda planning, but the present policy does not recognize that fact. So uh, to uh, expedite the process, knowing this has been a past practice, uh, the motion is suggested to temporarily suspend policy BGB, which is one that requires two readings, and immediately approve revision to policy BDB. And that simply adds and or the vice chair to that policy so that it clarifies that the vice chair can be involved in uh, setting the agenda for the board meetings along with the superintendent. Moved by. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we would read that out again, the motion to temporarily suspend policy uh, BGB and immediately approve the revision of policy, policy BEDB, a motion to approve the revisions to BEDB-R, uh, that's another one. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with the first one, BGB. Second. Second by Ed. Discussion. Um, I know like last time we had the, in our attempt to become more efficient and, uh, and more effective that we had Megan we put on uh, trying to work on our agenda and jiggling around. It would seem to me now that we have Tom uh, sitting in on the uh, agenda of developing things with the superintendent and uh, with Maria, you two should probably work together and then you can bring it to the, the agenda planning. Mm -hmm. I already met with Lee. Um, oh, I, I know, I'm oh. just saying, it would, oh, does it I seem mean, like a good idea now? If you want. I mean, we might oh, decide okay. tonight that this is okay or whatever, you know. I think that but I don't need to do it anymore. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I'm happy to work with Tom. <laughs> yeah. We want to work on it. We'll get together. Okay. Could we? I've lost where we are. <laughs> the motion on um, BGB. I think there was a motion. There was a second. Yes. Was a second. And yeah. we're involved yes. with the discussion. Further discussion. Um. Is there some place in our policies elsewhere that um, <coughs> would make it clear that this is a legal committee? Are your meetings all going to be posted? Mm. And will there be minutes taken? This is uh, the superintendent's meeting. It isn't our meeting. We get informed by the superintendent. So it's not a committee. Just asking. Okay. You agree? I agree. Okay. Further discussion? Could we have a vote, please? Six in the affirmative. Motion carries. And then we have agenda for it. Mm -hmm. okay, the, other, the other piece, uh, the... Uh, uh, where are we here? Okay. Uh, B E D B R is essentially a regulation or a rule. It's really not a policy, so it doesn't need to go through the two readings process. It's it's a, a procedural uh, fact. Uh, so at the request of the board, uh, uh, Megan and I did meet and uh, put forth uh, suggestions for the board to consider. So you see that. Uh, in your packet. I don't know if Megan wants to review what the format, essentially it tries to accommodate the request to move the actions up further in the agenda and there are additional recommendations that are made. So um, I, I tried to, um, 
like Lee said, to, you know, I think the sentiment was that, you know, we end up doing quite a bit of work at the, on the late hours of the evening. And so if we can try to get some of our action items up front. But I think the other piece of it is that we have a lot of reports <coughs> and we have staff and um, people who come and present to us and they have to be fresh the next morning and go to school and work. So how can we, you know, we don't want to push um, certain reports to the end. So um, what I did was we had some discussion at our last board meeting and I just tried to encapsulate what I heard and I changed some of the headings around. I also thought if it's the board's consideration that there's some items we currently have on our um, agenda that we may not want to continue to have. Um, one would be board comments um, and also correspondence. Uh, the rationale about board comments is I, my experience, if people say what they want, they figure out a way to get in there, you know, whenever, during discussion, during a specific point of um, that we're deliberating on. So I, I thought board comments may not be necessary. Um, and then correspondence, I also felt was another one that, you know, all our correspondence that we receive is available at the SAU, it's available to the public. Um, I feel that, you know, when you summarize it, it's, it, it can get into an area where it can be subjectively described. And it's, I think it's better to let people, you know, read the source and, and make their own assessment of that correspondence. So I thought perhaps those two areas are, are areas we may want to admit, but obviously, you know, we have to discuss that. Um, so the one that is, keeps bouncing around, did you give any thought to, you know, it seems like they've, they've dwindled in the public comments. I mean, it was like tonight, like, what, five minutes? And what people keep asking is, would we add a second public comment at the end? As painful as that is. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't look at that as a, I mean, we could talk about that. I know that there is a um, New Hampshire School Board Association recommended policy about public participation, and the recommendation is one public comment that's 15 minutes long. So I think that it's fair. I think we all would agree that we don't want to necessarily limit the duration of public comment, you know, um, but, you know, I, I don't have any strong feelings either way, really, about it. John. Well, considering the present state of the crowd we have here tonight, I understand we're not discussing a budget or anything super important tonight, but if we had another public comment, there wouldn't be very many comments right now. Okay. Um, I think what's getting lost in, in, in the discussion is that our meetings are school board meetings that are held in public. They're not public meetings. Um, I, I, people have spoken at other meetings about opportunities for public dialogue. Maybe, maybe you have, once a month you have open mic night where people can come and talk about what they want to talk about. Um, but it would not, it wouldn't take the time up of our, our district personnel who sit here. I mean, I'm impressed to see Kathleen Young here. She, she isn't even a full-time employee and it, she's got young children and she came to our meeting and sat until that point. I am very grateful for that. Um, but again, we have important work to do because that's, that's what we are given the responsibility to do. This is not a, a public meeting. It's a board meeting held in public. Um, I would just say, too, if we got in a situation down the road where we felt like we, you know, there's a lot of some very, you know, um, hot topics being discussed, and we felt like we wanted to have multiple public comments, we can vote to do so, right? Isn't that, we can change the, we can make a motion to change right. the agenda, too. Um, so, you know, that is, it's not as if we can never, we'll never right. ever have multiple, if we feel, if the board chair recommends it and we vote on it. I don't know. <laughs> so I guess I have know. mixed feelings. I have never experienced two public common parents before, but it seems to have been the history and practice of this district. And I understand there is a petition going around and I've certainly heard from people that they'd like to have it tonight. I don't think it would take up much of our time. But I have, you know, just a vague feeling that maybe when the budget starts, there'd be more people when we talk about cuts or additions. So I would have no problem having it on there. 
but it's not a big issue for me. Uh, I mean, I really like this this, uh, this restructuring, and, and I think it would be great, to, you know, because we can't change it. You know, we can change it, you know, at a meeting if we find that this... But I really think that, like, even the last meeting, we had a major issue at the end of the meeting, and it was, you know, I, I think that that should have been earlier. So I think this really solves that problem. I think getting rid of correspondence, as much as I've enjoyed doing that, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, you know, the onerous weight, to take that onerous weight off somebody's shoulders, <laughs> you know, nice. uh, uh, board comments, I think, you know, so I think it's a, it's a tighter schedule. I think it gets the, the major things up front. And I actually think we will probably be more efficient to have this, the action items up front and so that I don't think it'll push things back too late for those who give reports. And people don't give reports every, you know, I mean, some, you know most, you know, the transportation report, that's like a one time out of the year thing. So I think it's not going to affect a lot of people. So I, I, I think it's great. I think yeah. let's try it. And then if we have to adjust it, uh, we can adjust it. But I think this, this certainly deals with the issue that I've is concerning me for several meetings. So. Yeah. Um, I, Lee, thank you for uh, recommending that this be changed to a regulation um, because then it does give us the flexibility that Tom just discussed. Appreciate that. So, is there, um, I mean, it's your regulation. Is there a motion to approve this as, as presented? I've also noticed the lack of a Senate report kind of mandate in this and it's not like the Senate report takes that much of our time. I think my it's average report is 15 minutes. <coughs> okay. That should be on there. It's, that was, uh, I just copied the, the, the template. Okay. I just took the template that we had and right. I didn't mean to omit it. That was not okay. so. It wasn't <laughs> on the template <laughs> I started with. Personal <laughs> slight. I only really insulted yeah. myself. Yeah. No, you don't be, in, be insulted. So it should be, it should be under what, yeah. district yeah. reports? District yeah. reports. Yeah. So we should be adding D, student, Senate report. I think report. your other job. Yes. <laughs> um, I just want to, may I point out one other change, if you, in case you didn't notice. I also combine announcements and commendations because I noticed throughout my experience on the board that people, you often mix them up. <laughs> and so why not just move them together? <laughs> so. Good. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Megan. So do you need a motion, or is that? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so I move we adopt this uh, format this for our agendas for future meetings. Moved by Tom, second by Al. Discussion, Anne? Um, and for clarification, does that mean that we will do as uh, highlighted in yellow and omit Eight and ten. Yes. Okay. With the addition of the uh, student, student senate uh, being uh, in was in, in five section five. Further discussion. Wait, section four. You mean section four, just Not the reports? Section five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Further discussion. Hearing none. Could we have a show of hands, please? Six in the affirmative. Motion passes. Agenda planning, setting review. No, I, I there's one more D. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Approved policy B E A B, okay. which is the. Oh, cell phone. Okay. Cell Rec phones. Yeah. Recently, the uh, New Hampshire School Boards Association came up with a proposed policy uh, to deal with, uh, like I said uh, earlier. Uh, sometimes our practice doesn't keep up with the technology that is brought to us and we need to start back and reflect upon what's happening so uh, and we've had some correspondence regarding this sometimes it may appear that certain things are happening and uh, we just need to take a look at what this technology uh, presents to, and uh, try to adjust adjust to proper uh, decorum uh, so uh, this policy uh, addresses uh, electronic communication during board meetings. 
and uh, simply says that the school board members will refrain from using electronic communication. We obviously are aware that on some occasions there may be emergencies or things of that nature and that people are expecting such calls or whatever, they can alert the board chair and excuse themselves or whatever. But I think the, what it, this tries to address is, is the uh, semblance of folks using texting during board meetings and things of that nature that could uh, create uh, uh, issues. Uh, so uh, it's for the board protection and for, uh, I guess, the transparency of how we, we do our work. Uh, and I believe in the present policy is presented, uh, the cell phones is presented twice, this issue should only be once. So uh, this is presented tonight for board adoption for its first reading. Phil. I'd like to make a motion to approve policy BEAB. Uh, school board member use of electronic communication devices during a school board meeting for first read. <coughs> Excuse me. Second. Second by Tom. Discussion. Anne. Um, I think it's important for everyone to recognize um, a number of things. One, that your future, your life now in five minutes could be different. Mine's different. I have an 88-year-old father. I'm his primary caregiver. He had a stroke. He's now at risk uh, falls. He's on Coumadin. And I will have my phone on, and I won't turn it off, because if he falls, he has to contact me. Right. And um, that's just what it is. And if, if you know, someone wants to subpoena my cell phone records, have at it. <laughs> I don't think that's what this that's is what trying to address. No, it says that, that we can't yeah. use our cell phones. And I will not turn it off because oh. if he falls, he has to contact me. I'm on call, so I always have my cell phone on. To be well, honest. but be ready. I'm, yeah, well. Well, I, I think if you, if I could make a clarification, it said board members will, will try to refrain, will refrain. Board members will not use these devices during meetings to communicate with members of the public regarding official school board business, agenda items, or other board matters that are properly discussed publicly during board meetings. I think this is the gist of what this, this attended policy is intended to do. I think it's, it's, it's understandable that there are some things that can occur and it's appropriate for board members to excuse themselves and handle what they have to do during that time. That's all. It, it does not prohibit you from staying in touch with your father. Just let the public know that <coughs> and off you go. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I realize, too, I mean, if, you, it's, if there's an emergency, both Ed as a physician and everybody here has, well, most of us have uh, kids. I think the, the, um, the biggest part of it is, like, the texting, and, and potentially you could set yourself up for a, for a right-to-know violation if you were texting to a member of the community or to another member of the board. And I think that's probably what the gist of this... Uh, Procedure is not that someone would call this an emergency. It's just a, it's an act of trying to protect us from potentially uh, a right to know violation. We have a motion for other discussion. Could we have a show of hands, please? So is this is this the, the first reading? First reading. We're, we're going to we'll go to a second mm -hmm. reading. Yes. Yes. I just there was that mistake. Uh, the, the word cell phone mentioned Please twice, that, yeah. so yeah. I want to make sure that I, was no Right, you that. said that. Okay, I just want to make sure yes. it was corrected for the next read. Further discussion? Would there be, could I, could I, would there be some qualification except under extreme emergencies or something to, to indicate that it's not a categorical? Uh, I think the language is, is pretty clear about it. I think the, the situation and, you know, a personal situation is a personal situation. Yeah, you know, I have two young children. You know, my husband might text me, is this a bath night? You know, do they need to take showers? <laughs> Can I you know, I mean, that's sort of the real life stuff that happens when you meet at night and you have young children or you have other, um, you know, you're a caregiver for others. And I think that there's, there should be some, you know, there's some decorum. There's also some privacy. I don't think we should have to say, well, tonight, you know, I may have to get up because my daughter's been having bad dreams and I may have to say goodnight to her or something. You know, I, I don't feel like I should have to disclose that publicly, you yeah. know. You but so I think... just get up and leave. Yeah, you? no, I know. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that 
this is just to, I think we should look at it as uh, a means for, I think it's a good policy in terms of promoting transparency, giving assurances that this is, you know, this, this type of thing doesn't happen. And as far as I know, has not happened since I've been on the board. So it's just in writing. So I think it's a good thing. I think if I could just clarify again, I think it's the spirit mm -hmm. we're trying to capture here. Right. That's all. And, and, I, and it's not intended for people to take this personally. It's really intended to protect people and to express what the spirit should be. Uh, and we know that there are circumstances that uh, go beyond this and that needs to be acknowledged. Further discussion? Could we have a show of hands, please? Six in the affirmative. Motion carries. Now we're on closing actions. Agenda planning, setting, review of future agenda items. Um, I sent an email to you and Lee um, yes. asking you to add um, our curriculum review cycle and um, board members involvement in the committees that are formed to do that that curriculum review? I think that will be perhaps in July. Um, I have a <laughs> planning calendar. <laughs> For some reason, my planning calendar is coming to an end. Uh, <laughs> I so I, I have, after, Ju after June 20th, I have everything other. I mean, it's listed, so uh, Mr. Morris will have them and be able to deal with them. But uh, there are some other... Uh, last item uh, that I'm trying to clear up for my plate and uh, but they're listed they're not forgotten my and expectation I think if you go back the historically meeting. you'll see everything you've mentioned nothing was left off it's all there uh, uh, I have a leg up to throw in the other category it's what we started talking about before the meeting was starting and that is uh, could we add on something about uh, developing a uh, like the uh, Friday updates that Durham has that model where we're able to communicate what's going on to the district and specifically I think the group that's being missed it's not parents uh, with kids in school because they're they're getting emails it's for people in the community that don't have kids in the schools so are not getting information about what's going on here so if we could, could develop some kind of a Friday update model thing where we're able to send out um, I think it would really help communication would that be a charge of someone on the communications committee? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I have an item I'd like to add to Megan. the future. It doesn't have to happen in the next meeting. I don't expect it would. Um, this is sort of, it, it ties in with curriculum, and it's about our math program, our use of uh, the everyday math curriculum. And I think it would be useful to have some discussion or presentation about you know that curriculum why we're using it and I also think it, it ties into this concern about reaching boys in our district um, I think that there's a it might be a misperception but we need to I think we, I'd like to hear why we're using this curriculum still are there uh, other curriculums you know curricula that might be worth considering I don't know I, I, I think it's an important area it's I know it's a deep concern to many parents who have talked to me to understand that. Thank you. Anything else? When do we meet in July and August? Um, it's the Cal 18th calendar. of July. You, you, is it you, the third, third, third? The 18th, I think it is. Wednesdays. Third Wednesdays? Yeah, we adopted a calendar. Maybe it must be posted. July is the 18th, I know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's in the calendar. I'll tell you. For some reason, July is in the morning right now. It's like the New York time. Future meeting <laughs> day, 620. Yes. And? And I'll just uh, announce, too, that we're starting the interviews for the Master Principal tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, if things progress successfully, I hope to have a nomination for the 20th. Okay. Uh, I'm waiting for a motion, a motion to adjourn. Second. And Unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs>